Um, good morning, colleagues, and welcome to the 14th meeting of 2016 of the Finance and Constitution Committee, and a happy St Andrew's Day to you all. Um, the first item on agenda this morning is to decide whether to take items four and five in private. Are members agreed? Yes. Thank you, members are agreed. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence from Professor Graham Roy, who is the director of the Fraser and Allender Institute in the UK, autumn statement and Scotland's budget. Uh, members have received copies of Professor Roy's slides uh, from the briefing that he conducted last week. I'm sorry I couldn't be at your briefing. Um, I, know, I know that some members were. Uh, and I welcome you very much warmly. welcome you to the committee meeting this morning, Professor. I, I wonder if you wish to make an opening statement. Yes, yes please. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, convener, and thanks uh, for the invitation to come back and um, give our thoughts on the autumn statement and the potential implications for Scotland. I guess there's a number of things that were quite interesting from, from last week's statement. Firstly, there was obviously the revisions to growth for the next couple of years by the Office for Budget Responsibility. So they forecast that uh, next year the economy would slow slightly to about 1.4% and then back up to 1.7% the year after. Um, so in relative terms, quite a significant slowing, but actually in comparison to other forecasters, it was slightly more on the optimistic side. And crucially, they expect that in the end of the years of the forecast period, growth will return back to close to trend. And there's obviously a lot of uncertainty about that. So as we've seen, you know, there's quite a lot of variation in different forecasts for the next couple of years, and that obviously has implications for the public finances. The big thing then is the public, what happened to the public finances and quite a significant increase in borrowing over the next few years relative to what George Osborne was predicting back in March. So I guess the big number there that is the big takeaway is the increase of borrowing of 120 billion. I guess there's a couple of things in there which are quite interesting to think about. About half of that is expected to come from the weakening of the economy and Brexit, but some of it also comes from some classification changes, but also a slightly um, poorer tax receipts performance this year, um, even before Brexit was meant to happen, and that has had an impact on the overall um, public finances. So tracing that through, then the Chancellor faces a decision about what he would then do about public spending in the next few years. What we then saw was essentially, particularly on the revenue side of things, we decided to wait and see um, and um, continue largely with the departmental re resource spending uh, f uh, plans that George Osborne had. So you look at the Scottish budget being projected to fall in uh, real terms of around about 3%, assuming that Scotland matches UK tax revenues over the next few years. I guess the big difference then was on capital. So there was quite a significant stimulus to capital investment. So that was the £800 million coming to the Scottish budget cumulatively over the next, uh, over the next few years. And that, um, in some ways, it depends which way you look at it. Glass half full, glass half empty. So on the one hand, it's quite a significant increase in where we are just now. So £800 million additional. When you add in the new borrowing powers, that is actually you know, a, a further additional um, real terms increase in capital borrowing. So if you actually look at the full amount of capital that the Scottish Government could do in 2020-21 relative to 10-11, it's actually slightly higher in real terms once you add in the full amount of capital borrowing as well. So that was quite interesting. Again, on the other side, though, it still is relatively low in comparison to 10-11, just purely on the capital Dell. So it's down in real terms. So you can either look at that one way or, or the other. Um, that then obviously has implications for what happens with the Scottish budget, and we'll see the details of that in the next couple of weeks. OK, Professor Roy. Uh, Murdo. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Professor Roy. Um, uh, j just before I come to my question, I just want to pick up on that, that last point you mentioned about the overall envelope of capital spending, which I think is quite interesting. When, when the Scottish Government borrows for capital projects, what, what are the restrictions on how it can borrow for these projects? So, so under the new fiscal framework, you can essentially borrow from largely two sources. So they could go to the private market if they wanted to, or you can borrow from public work loans board, so you can go get, get the same rate as, as, as the UK. And that's quite, I mean, £450 million additional capital borrowing at the end of the period is, you know, is quite significant when you add in the additional money that's coming as well. OK, thank you. Um, what, what I was really going to ask you about was, was the overall size of the budget. Um, now, the figures we got from, from uh, SPICE um, tell us that, in real terms, the budget for 2017-18 will be up £130 million on 2016-17. That splits, as far as I can work out, 23 million up on a resource Dell and 106 million up on capital Dell. Would those figures be in line with your own 
assessment? Yes, so um, so I guess the two numbers that are quite interesting to take you, one is what's happening between this year and next year, uh, and then what's happening toward the end of the forecast um, uh, period. And you see actually pretty much the, the budget between 16, 17 and 17, 18 is flat, but actually a, a, in revenue terms, it's a small wheel terms increase. Now, one of the reasons for that is um, how the deflators have changed. So uh, imputed rent, I don't mean to go into a big discussion about imputed rent, but uh, there was a change in methodology about how you use imputed rent. So the deflators have actually changed. So they've actually become slightly lower uh, and some adjustments within the year around budgets have actually lowered the cash terms number for 16, 17 and increased cash terms number for 17, 18 relative to where it was. So yes, you get this modest real terms increase between 16, 17 and 17, 18, and then the additional cuts coming on the back of that. So that's slightly different from you know, what was planned back in uh, uh, earlier on this year. And I'm just wondering you know, how this puts into context all the discussions we had prior to the autumn statement. You might remember when you came in previously and we were talking about the potential for cuts in the resource budget, the impact that would have on, on the Scottish Government's planning, which of course was the justification for the Finance Secretary delaying publication of his budget because of, of, of the expectation that there might be further reductions. Of course, that hasn't happened. So, so perhaps we could just have gone and seen the budget much earlier. Um, I mean, I guess, so two things on that. One is... Um, I think largely, essentially, the plans have remained unchanged from uh, what George Osborne had. As I said, there's been a slight change with methodology around the deflator, which changes whether it's increasing or decreasing uh, uh, in one year to next, but it's relatively small, small numbers. But I think the big question was, in the run-up to this, what, was, what would actually happen? And I think, as we said in the September report, there was a lot of uncertainty about it. And the scenarios that we had potentially had a stimulus this year, so actual genuine real-terms cash you know, and real terms increase from this year into next, or additional consolidation. And I guess the Chancellor faced that difficult balancing act between further consolidation or a stimulus. And in the end, he's kind of almost decided to wait and see. So to be fair to the Scottish Government in that context, the fact that um, it's turned out this way, you know, it was going to turn out one other way or the other, but it, there was a lot of uncertainty about it. So to be fair, that was, I think, um, that was that was a kind of a, a useful it was a, it was a justifiable position to take um, I think where it gets slightly more interesting is what happens in the future because I think this year potentially with the budget being flat in real terms in a sense you know almost hides some of the challenges that are coming down the line some of the difficult choices that will come in years two three and four and I think that gets moves into the issues about whether a one-year budget is appropriate or whether you need to set out spending plans going towards the end of the end of the Parliament okay. Uh, Professor Roy, just talk us through about that longer term, because it's interesting to see the front page of the Scotsman this morning and some of the projections being made. I don't know if you had a chance to see that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and obviously, in your resource plans and the historical context slide that you have in your own material you provided us, uh, I'm not sure they reflect this, exactly the same numbers, but they seem to reflect the same direction. Yeah. So I think just if you could talk us through that, because if any Cabinet Secretary setting their budget for the next financial year, I need to obviously consider what the longer term issues are. Yeah, so, um, so yes, yeah, so, so essentially you've got the budget increasing very slightly in real terms this year into next, so about a £20 million real terms increase, depending on which uh, adjustment you make for inflation. But then looking at our projections up to 2020, 2021, um, you're looking at around about an £800 million real terms decrease between 16, 17 and the end of that period. So that works out around about just over a 3% real terms, uh, real terms cut. I think the number today, which is slightly higher than that, um, you need to be careful there's no, you know, avoid double counting here, because essentially what that does is essentially add in the implications of some of the commitments that the Scottish Government has done uh, in, you know, in health and childcare, which then means that other non-protected areas face a cut of you know, closer to 1.2, 1.3 billion pounds. But I guess that's a discretionary choice by the Scottish Government. That's not the budget being cut by 800 million. That's a decision to prioritise some areas over others, which then mean that the other areas have to take um, a larger real terms, a larger real terms cut. And that's in our presentation. Depending upon which assumptions you use about growth, that works in around about you know anywhere between a 10, 13 percent real terms cut in 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 the unprotected areas. But the crucial point about that is that that's 
part of a discretionary choice by the Scottish Government to make these commitments in, in these areas. So it's, you need to watch slightly double counting there. OK, that I think neatly leads us to James Kelly. Sure. Uh, thank you, Convener. You, you've described the situation where the budget in terms of next year is it's almost going to be flat, small real terms increase, and then um, cumulative, cumulatively over a period of time there's an £800 million decrease. And you also paint a picture where the UK economy is going to be smaller, unemployment rising, uh, inflation rising, <laughs> wages not rising at the same rate as inflation. Um, can you maybe just give a bit of description as to how these these other factors, uh, the, the, the factors that re result in a smaller uh, sized UK economy, you know, like uh, inflation, lower growth, rising unemployment, wages not going up as high as inflation, how that how those factors impact on the Scottish budget? Okay, um, uh, just just one point of clarification: that the eight hundred million pound cut in real terms is not cumulative. It's just it's just from sixteen. It's a difference between sixteen, seventeen, and twenty, twenty, twenty one. So the cumulative number will be bigger than that. So that's just one year to the next. You obviously have the cuts in you know seventeen, eighteen, eighteen, nineteen as well. So the cumulative number will actually be bigger than eight hundred eight hundred million. I am. I can add them up for you. I'll, okay. I can, I can, I can okay. add them up here. But I'll. Um, so, I, I mean, I guess your wider point gets into um, what's the overall outlook for the UK for the UK economy. And um, obviously, the Office for Budget Responsibility revised down their forecasts for the UK economy over the next um, over the next couple of years. What was really quite interesting, again, with their forecasts, um, without going too much into detail, was what they're assuming is happening to productivity. And one of the key challenges we've had since the financial crisis is really quite weak productivity growth. And um, that's projected to at least continue for the next couple of years. Uh, and that is a thing that drives what's going to happen to earnings, for example. So we expect earnings to grow much more slowly than they had been predicting. And with inflation to rise, that in turn leads through to lower real ho household incomes. So I think that you've got this balance between an economy that's slightly slower and that actually is feeding through to real household incomes and higher inflation um, at the same time as continued consolidation on the, on the public finances side. So you've got that mix of pressure on households, but also a, a continued consolidation on, on the government side. So that means that there'll be less resources going around to pay for public expenditure in real terms, but at the same time, um, a, a squeeze on households. I guess the key challenge, though, is that, um, and what I guess the Chancellor was wrestling with, was how do you actually grow your economy out of this? So if productivity growth is weak, how can you, what can you do to boost productivity and to restore the public finances to health? Because health? that's crucial to what actually grows revenues in the long run. And that, in part, explains the new investment that he was doing around the productivity plan and the new support for R&D and things like that. So. Um, I guess the next couple of years, both on the household side and the public spending side, will be quite challenging, and it'll be interesting to see you know, what happens over the next couple of years. OK, just, just in terms, again, going back to the, the overall size of the, the budget envelope and, and looking further down the line where there are cuts of £800 million for the, the, the year specified and then further cuts, what are the options in terms of... Uh, taxation to mitigate those cuts. You know, we've we see one view in the IPPR report this morning of, you know, a three pence tax rise being regard being needed to, to mitigate the cuts. What are the, what are the potential options? You know, how much uh, in terms of different scenarios would different taxation policies raise? So. Uh I mean, there you then you now get into what could the Scottish government do with its new tax levers that are coming. Uh, starting in April, and um, there they have, in, th in paper, quite a bit of discretionary power to do things differently. So, you know, one pence in income tax approximately will raise 500 million. So, if you're facing an 800 million pounds cut, you know, one one and a half two percent increase in income tax would be, in real terms, sufficient to to compensate to compensate that. That's ultimately a political choice about whether you want to do that. Um, obviously, that needs to be balanced with what's the outlook for the economy. So if the economy is going to be slightly more fragile, um, you face the challenges of increasing income tax. What might be the economic impacts of that? And there's a lot of uncertainty about that. We genuinely don't know how the you know what implications will be from using these devolved powers on the economy. Um, on the one hand, 
there will be some concerns that it could lead to a slower economy relative to the rest of the UK, which will have implications. Or another says it might be a way of increasing revenue, which you can then use to spend on public services, which will have its own positive boost in the economy. So it's a difficult choice, and that's ultimately a, a political choice about what you do. But the choice is now there, which I guess is the key point. They now have an opportunity to take different tax decisions if they want to, to make up some of or all of the, all of the all of the drop. Okay, thank you, Dean. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, Professor Roy, the Chancellor mentioned that he wants the, the UK economy to be match fit and uh, had a real focus on productivity growth in, in, in the autumn statement. And productivity is also a priority for the Scottish Government. As things stand, um, Scotland remains in the third quartile uh, in terms of productivity, I think roughly 25% behind Ireland and, and Denmark and, and other countries. With additional um, 800 million capital spend coming to Scotland, what would be um, your recommendations as to how that could be spent to uh, boost productivity and what, what other policy steps could the government take in, in Scotland to uh, boost productivity in the short and, and medium term? Um, I guess far be it for me to give a policy prescription about what the Scottish government should do, but I mean, I think the, there's, a, you know, there's a few points in there. I think Coming back to my point about the importance of productivity, um, productivity is absolutely crucial for what happens to um, future tax revenues, not only in the UK, but also in Scotland. One of the reasons why the UK public finances have not actually been as healthy as though we are predicted on a consistent basis over years is actually not because they've not made the spending cuts. Some, some of the areas in welfare they've not delivered um, and they've moved back on that, but they've actually delivered most of the spending cuts by department. The reason the public finances have disappointed is because tax revenues have been a lot lower than would have been expected, and that comes through productivity. So we've not had productivity growth at long-term average for over 10 years now, um, and that actually underpins the OBR's forecast going forward. They assume we get back to that point, but we haven't been there for 10 years. So one of the key risks in the forecasts that the OBR acknowledge is that if productivity doesn't get back to where it was, then the deficit will be a, a lot worse. So I think in some ways that is one of the reasons motivating the Chancellor to, to make these investments in these, in these areas. Um, and we know that that's been a challenge in Scotland for a number of years as well about our productivi productivity performance. We've caught up in part with the rest of the UK, but the UK does lag behind everybody else, so we need to do more. I think the new capital investment provides an opportunity to do that. As I said, you know, you've got an £800 million cumulative increase in capital investment, plus the £450 million per year additional capital you can now put into uh, capital, uh, sorry, to put into investment from the new borrowing powers. So I think you do have an opportunity, particularly on the infrastructure side, to, to look at how you can uh, increase that expenditure and therefore boost, boost the economy. Thank you. Ash? Thank you. Um, the UK said um, at the autumn statement they want to achieve a step change in productivity, but they matched that with an investment of 0.2% of GDP. Is it possible to get a step change in productivity with such a small investment? So, um, so the, 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 the figure of around about, I think we, we worked out about 0.25%, which is the, um, essentially the, the, the value of the national Productivity Investment Fund divided by the share, the, the share of the economy. So in that context, it's relatively small. And if you think that UK productivity is around about 20% lower than some of our key competitors, then I guess that puts that into context of, on that regard, it's a relatively small stimulus to tackling that. Um, on the other hand, though, in terms of public sector investment, it's actually up to a, a relatively high level in historic terms. So um, it's a bit of a kind of a mixed bag in that regard. Um, I think a lot of it will come down to how it's delivered. Um, and we actually await to see some of the detail behind this. So what we had last week was ambitions by the government to spend you know, an extra um, £2 billion in R&D by 2020, uh, 20, 20, 2021. We actually don't know what that would look like. Um, we don't know how much of that will be to replace potential European funding that is lost. So is this net additional money? Um, so I think the ambition is there and the rhetoric is there. The question then will be is, well, actually, what we'll see in terms of the delivery and will these, will these measures have an impact? I should caution that some of the numbers that have been included in the National Productivity Investment Fund include things like housing. Um, so again, that number 
is potentially slightly inflated because there is some evidence that housing and better access and better links to work, etc., does improve productivity, but it's 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 a bit more of an indirect link than some of the other areas, such as as R and D and and infrastructure, for example. So you said in your earlier answer to Dean Lockhart that the UK is seriously lagging behind in this area. Um, would you say that's because we are just spending less on it? Can, can you put it into a European context? What sort of percentage of GDP would a, an average European country be spending? Um, it varies, and I think you've got to be slightly careful about trying to do direct comparisons because people measure things slightly differently. But yes, definitely, the UK has typically spent less on investment than most of our competitors, both in the public and, and, and the private side. Um, and um, we have good quality infrastructure, but we actually tend not to have you know, a lot of it. And that's a particular issue around um, transport elements, for example. Um, and I'll avoid going into anything about trains, please. Um, but, it, but I think that there's a there's a general point about um, you know with Brexit happening, and we think that the headwinds will be there. Um, and whether you agree that the headwinds are going to be really strong or whether they're going to be slightly less, I think most people would accept that Brexit, at least in the short run, will be a challenge. And there's a debate, a, you know, and a, a valid debate about the scale of that. Um, so the solution to that is what you do about productivity. And as I mentioned, you know, the UK's productivity performance over the last few years has really been quite dire. We, you know, we. Long-term productivity through the second half of the 20th century around about two and a half percent. You know, where last year's productivity was about 0.8, the year before it was about 0.7. It's really, really quite weak. So the key thing will be how we can tackle that and boost that, uh, and that will in turn feed through to growth. Thank you, Neil. And just <clears throat> to follow up on the, the question about the National Productivity Investment Fund, and in, in your slide you talked about the key areas being housing, transport, telecoms, and R&D were the main focus of the the UK government's. Um, productivity Investment Fund. Just following up from, from Dean Lockhart's question, are there any areas that the Scottish Government should be should be focusing on in terms of you know, passing on any Barnet consequentials, capital spending consequentials, or, or should we be looking for a different balance in any of these expenditures? Because we've obviously heard from Anton Muscatelli recently about the need to increase R&D expenditure. We've obviously heard from other people about, about the importance of all, all these areas. Um, um, yeah, so I mean, I think the, there's a number of different areas which I think would be that the, I think the government will be looking at over the next few years, particularly around innovation and what more can be done there to stimulate, um, you know, R&D within a Scottish context, particularly links with universities and what how you can increase the interaction between the university sector and uh, and business. So there'll be some areas there that the government will be looking at. I think, you know. Transport, transport infrastructure, again, is we know has strong links to productivity, and with this additional money, they'll be looking, I'm sure, quite hard at what particular unique issues in Scotland need to be addressed and where the potential real benefits could, could come from. And I guess that's the benefit of, of devolution in that context, is that with this additional money, you now have the opportunity to identify the priorities within Scotland and see where the key, the key elements come um, from that. I think some of the interesting things will be around where we've been before, around what happens to digital. We know that that is going to be crucial in the long run, so thinking about how the government deliver their digital plans and whether they need to tweak that or additional money can go into that will, will be quite crucial. So I guess what will be quite interesting will be to see, given you know the priorities that the UK government has set out around productivity and making productivity their flagship element, with additional money coming on capital, what does the Scottish government do with that to um, either, you know, follow suit or take a different path. Okay, thanks. Adam's got a supplementary. Can I just ask, um, Professor, a, ver a very quick supplementary on this, maybe an unfair question, but w w what do you mean by infrastructure? Because you, in, an, in an answer a few minutes ago, you seemed to imply that housing was different from infrastructure, and yet housing is often rolled up into infrastructure. Do, do, you mean, do you mean roads, or do you mean digital connectivity, or do you mean something else? Yeah, so I mean, I think what I was really meaning there was that um, infrastructure classifies a lot, uh, you know, a broad area from uh, from housing through to transport, etc. I guess my point is really around um, some infrastructure we know has direct causal rela relationships to the economy, um, much more directly than particularly in some other areas, and they also maybe have a much shorter impact. Uh, a much you know, the, the impact between investment and then the, the boosting the economy is, is over happens over a much shorter time period than in other areas. So, for example, something like housing, um, 
has very much has, has more of an indirect but very much a long-term impact on the economy, particularly around inclusive growth and boosting productivity of, you know, of of households, etc. But it's more of an indirect and it's a longer term thing. So the government will face that choice is do they go to invest in infrastructure that has a more immediate uh, direct link between the, with the economy or something that has a longer term, uh, more indirect. And that ultimately, again, is the choice that, that they face. So am I really just making the point that within that capsulation of national productivity, there's a lot of things in there which capture both direct effects, but also indirect effects as well. Very interesting area. What about energy efficiency measures in, in, that, in that regard, in terms of their ability to help those in the lower end of the, the social spectrum, together with the impact on growth? Yeah, very much so. I mean, the, the, you get on that, there's the stuff about what, what can you actually do to... Uh, these elements will have a capital element, they'll have you know a, a boosting growth element, a direct effect, but they'll also have long-term effects as well from great efficiency there. So I think this is where, you know, the, what would be really useful to see is when the government publish the budget, when they make these choices, is to set out exactly how they believe that they are impacting both in the economy or both in inclusive growth. So you get the full justification about why they're doing it. So what we had last week from the UK government was quite a lot of ambition and some numbers attached to it, but less yet on the specifics, understandably, about how they would actually implement that. And I think that's where it will be nice, interesting to see what the Scottish Government does as well. But it could be on energy efficiency, it could be on housing, it could be on transport. But that setting out of the, what, where the choices are will be really crucial. Okay. Ivan? Yeah, thanks, um, yeah, there's a couple of things I just wanted to explore a wee bit further. Um, and maybe take a step back and look at the... Um, we're talking about the numbers and we're talking about them based on the OBR, but clearly the OBR is based on some assumptions and it's just to first of all explore some stuff around about that. We're talking about an extra 120 billion borrowing, but then you're saying that's potentially optimistic compared to some of the other forecasts. Um, and the OBR's clearly made some assumptions around about what type of Brexit, etc. But I suppose I just want to understand, or what's your understanding of the information the OBR had to make those decisions and what kind of range is there if it's a different type of Brexit, how much worse potentially could it be? OK, so there's probably two points to make. One is the OBR's forecast in the short run, but then <clears throat> also what may happen in the slightly longer term. So. What the OBR have done is essentially assume pretty much the same as most other forecasters that next year the economy will slow down in um, relative terms because business investment is likely to be lower because of potential uncertainty around Brexit, but also consumption will fall um, because of higher inflation feeding through to real incomes, and that will lead to a slower growth over the next couple of years relative to others. So they are forecasting growth of about 1.4% next year, then 1.7%, and then back up to 2.1% um, the year after. Just to put that, in, put that in context, the Bank of England are forecasting 1.4% uh, next year, but only 1.5% the year after, and then um, only 1.6% the year after that. So there's a bit of a difference between the OBR and the, the Bank of England, which is quite significant. So um, ultimately, there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about these forecasts. But if the Bank of England forecasts were to turn out to be correct, then that would obviously lead to weaker growth, um, higher unemployment and a weaker public finances. And therefore, the OBR will, will have, to, have to address that. So that's essentially really in the short term. But there's a really interesting part in the... OBR right buried away in one of the annexes, where what they do is they model what might happen if you have different scenarios for productivity performance. So as I mentioned, the OBR essentially assume that um, the productivity returns to trend by the end of the decade and into the 2020s. So they're assuming that productivity grows around about 2%. And that's the number that drives the reduction in uh, net borrowing over the next few years, taking you know, public sector net borrowing to you know, about £20 billion. What's quite interesting is they also run two scenarios about what happens if productivity doesn't rise. So if productivity stays the same as it was last year, and even under that scenario, you're looking at instead of borrowing about £20 billion, you're borrowing £50 billion. So um, crucial there is how the economy does. If the economy doesn't perform as well as as they hope, they've got a scenario in there that b the borrowing rises to 50 billion. But of course, productivity could return, could actually be slightly higher, we could get the bounce back and the economy could grow more significantly over the next few years. And then under that scenario, they believe that the deficit will be eliminated and you'll actually be running a surplus. 
So I think there's two key crucial points to this. One is what is the outlook in the short term for the economy? And there's a lot of uncertainty about that. Who's right? OBR, independent forecasts, or the, the Bank of England. But then even setting that aside, what is the long term trajectory for the UK economy? And that's a key thing that will drive the public finances in, in the medium to long term. And that's probably arguably the most important thing to, to focus yeah. on. But even in the short term, it looks at that this could be an optimistic forecast based on some of the other ones that are out there. Well, and and the, the OBR have been quite clear that yeah. they are um, more optimistic than the Bank of England, slightly more optimistic than the average of independent forecasts. Um, and to be fair, most forecasters have been revising up their forecasts, particularly for 2016. So there is a lot of uncertainty behind it. And it is based on assumptions and a, and a judgment call um, you know, a judgment call on, on the, what assumptions you put into the forecast. The OBR are quite clear about what they do model and what they don't model around Brexit. So um, they're essentially just taking the public statements of the UK government. So they model that up. They assume that the UK leaves in 2019. and um, That has an impact in the period up to then. But then they don't assume anything beyond that about future trading relationships. And clearly that will have an impact on on future growth and future public finances. OK, and another area I wanted to just explore, which I'm, I'm a wee bit confused about, is round about population assumptions. Because if, if I look at what we've got, I mean, UK population has been growing at migration, net migration, 350,000 a year or thereabouts, which is about half a percent of the population, which is um, a fairly chunky number. Um, so Brexit is, is, a, is on the, a big part of the vote for Brexit. It was on the assumption that that population growth and that migration would be, to put their words, under control um, and would reduce into low tens of thousands. So if that is true, and you're also talking, and you're also got an assumption that you return to a 2% plus growth rate, uh, GDP growth rate, um, and you're assuming productivity stays at the current low levels, those can't all be true. So either population is going to say current levels, in which case what was the point of voting for Brexit, or the GDP numbers, growth numbers, um, are, are, are way over optimistic by at least half a percent, um, or something magic is going to happen in productivity over the next few years that, that, that um, uh, magic out of nowhere. So what's your comment on that? So what the OBR do is, it said, so essentially in productivity, they assume that there's a hit to productivity in the next couple of years, but it returns to... Um, long-term trend toward the end of the, the forecast period. Um, what they assume about migration is that they had been planning to increase the forecast for migration um, toward the end of the forecast period relative to what they had forecast in March because migration had been much higher than it had been. Um, what they do now is assume that essentially that increase doesn't happen because of Brexit. So there is still migration into the UK built into their, into their scenario planning. Um, um, but they've just reduced the level of migration compared to their forecast. So they're still assuming that there is positive net migration into the UK. Wow, just now. Yes, but there's so. But not increasing that it might yes, have done otherwise. So okay. migration had been higher, so mm -hmm. therefore they were planning to increase. Mm -hmm. But they're just not doing that increase yeah. now. They're just keeping it um, uh, what the previous forecast had been. So they so they still have positive net migration, but it's not as high as it would have been under the remaining in the European Union, which they've been planning to change. Uh, and as I said, they then increased productivity back up to 2% um, at the end of the period. And that's the key drivers that influence their right. GDP forecasts. If migration was to drop to the numbers that Brexiteers have assumed in the low tens of thousands, these numbers don't hold up. Well, yeah, if you change your migration assumptions, if you're lowering migration assumptions, then that will naturally reduce your, your, your GDP forecasts. Um, but as I said, to be fair to the OBR, what they've done is tried to be as neutral and as balanced as possible around what are the things that are driving the forecast. So they've not assumed changes in that migration thing. They've not also not assumed changes in potential trade relationships. They've not assumed changes in how the trade relationship might feed through to productivity. So um, I think what you'll see is the is the Brexit deal you know, is finalised, then the OBR will have to naturally come back to their forecasts and change them, and that will ultimately be the thing that will drive. So I think one of the key things with the forecasts, both for the economy and the public finances, is just the level of uncertainty in all of this is, 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 is sig highly significant. Am I right, though, in terms of the most pessimistic um, forecast that we're talking about, potentially £220 billion of additional debt by 2020, 
if it was a hard Brexit. I think that was the number I saw from the OBR. Yeah, I mean, I think within that, there's a couple of numbers flying around which are slightly confusing around that. So um, the, 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 what OBR are forecasting on their current assumptions is that you'll have £120 billion additional borrowing over the next few years because of that. The increase in debt, the £200 billion, actually some of that is coming through reclassification changes. So some of the money that the Bank of England are doing is now being classified as public sector, and that adds about £100 billion onto the debt. So one of the reasons why net debt increases significantly between this forecast and the last forecast is actually a reclassification change. So, But the key number, I think, to focus on is the £120 billion, which is the additional borrowing relative to what had been planned, which will happen over the next few years. But this will all have to be revisited because what the OBR have done is essentially, you know, not really make a long-term forecast on what Brexit might look like. And if you have a hard Brexit, soft Brexit, middle Brexit, then then they'll have to have a look at have to look at their forecasts again. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Willie, did you see? Did I see you wanted a supplementary on this? But I uh, just on uh, general borrowing and forecast and stuff. If I could, Bruce, thanks very much, uh, Professor Roy. One of your slides, uh, one of your slides there that you gave us has key, some key messages on it, and, it, and one of them says that there's £120 billion pounds of a additional borrowing forecast, of which only £23 billion is due to policy announcements. So my arithmetic tells me that's £97 billion pounds worth of additional borrowing, uh, and a substantial portion of that is attributable to Brexit. Could you just give us a wee flavour of what, what's that actually for? Why are we borrowing that amount of money? And what kind of impact does that have on the overall national debt? Mm -hmm. Okay, so so the number there is this, you know, this the 120 billion pound additional borrowing. So that's the cumulative borrowing um, between now and 2021 relative to what the chance had been forecasting back in March in, in his budget. So uh, within that, you're right, 60 billion of that the OBR have attributed to Brexit effects, and. Um, 25 billion of that, so 23, 25 billion of that is some policy. Um, interestingly, around about a further 25 billion of that is just a general weakness in the economy beforehand. So tax revenues have actually been disappointing in 2016, 17, and they expect that that will continue going forward. So there's actually, even before Brexit, borrowing was going to rise relative to what had been planned. And there's a small difference, the remainder is a difference between classifications about. Um, um, borrowing and where and where that comes from, so the OBR essentially set out where they think that um, how that additional sixty billion pounds will will come from, where the different sources of that you know kick through. The two key ones really to look at are what is what they think is going to happen to um, tax revenues because of you know uh, business investment uh, leading to lower growth in the economy, which in turn leads to lower long-term growth in corporation tax, national insurance, income tax, etc. But then also, crucially, they forecast that there will be lower consumption going forward, which in turn feeds through to lower tax revenues. So cumulatively, they actually have revised down their income tax revenue forecast of around about £66 billion. So that's really quite a significant downward revision to tax revenues. So essentially, the, the key driver of that £60 billion increase in borrowing is essentially a slower economy leading to slower growth in tax revenues, which in turn leads to higher levels of borrowing. I mean, the slide goes on, it talks about, you know, a substantial deterioration in public finances, it'll imply lower wages, higher unemployment, lower living standards, a significant downward revision to forecasts of growth. It talks about 12 fiscal rules since 1997, 10 of which are broken are abandoned. This is hardly an encouraging picture in St Andrew's Day for Scotland, is it? And uh, am I right in saying that the, the overall national debt is heading towards the the heady total of two trillion pounds? Um, well, <laughs> um, thankfully, these numbers are not my numbers today, so I'm not the one giving you the, the gloomy news. I'm just we're just talking about that. I mean, I think yeah. I mean, essentially, what you've got is, is a situation where. The, chance, the previous Chancellor had had a plan to restore the public finances back to, to balance. And there was obviously a debate about whether that was a right or a wrong thing to do. But, yeah, so essentially um, that, was going to be more, that was going to be tougher because tax revenues were not performing as well as had been planned. 
even before Brexit. So essentially now you add in the downward revisions that have been made to the economy, to living standards, to earnings, as a result of, of the referendum outcome. And that then just means that that ability to meet these public finance targets becomes much more challenging. So you have an increase in borrowing. So instead of you know, running, a, uh, you know, running a surplus of, of 10 billion, is now running a deficit of 20 billion. Um, debt is now higher, so it's rising towards 90% of, of GDP. And I guess in turn, that just means that the fiscal rules have been broken. Um, again, um, quite a number of fiscal rules have been broken. Um, and now he's got a new set of fiscal rules, which are more about, rather than constraining public spending, it's more about giving them some headroom to do it. So um, he's left about £26 billion worth of additional stimulus he could do if the economy slows worse than, than he expects. Um, and ultimately that has led to a, you know, a set of weaker public finances going forward. So I think you're looking at the budget continuing to be cut up to 2021, but even then the repair job is probably not likely to have been completed and you will look at potentially some further cuts or consolidations into the 2020s as they try and restore the public finances back to balance, because that's what they said the overall objective will be, is that they will run a balanced budget at some point in the next parliament. There's also a debate about whether that's a good thing to do or not, but that's what they plan to do, so that would imply further real terms cuts to public spending going forward. Is there any good news anywhere on the horizon? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think the big thing, which is, which is to be fair, is that the economy has held up um, much better than expected in 2016 than most forecasters had had planned. And I guess there was three there's three key things about how Brexit will have an impact on the economy. One was the potential real short sharp impact and uncertainty that could come from the shock result. And if you think about the immediate couple of months after Brexit, that was a really quite a significant risk that was there that the economy could actually slow down really quite quickly in 2016. There's then the, the adjustment phase as you travel to the new, uh, new world. And even I think the people who supported Brexit said that the, as you go through that adjustment phase, then there will be some challenges within there. And then there's what's the longer term impacts from something like Brexit. And that's where there's much more debate about, you know, potentially impacts on trade, but also people who supported Brexit seeing, seeing that as an opportunity. So I think the positive bit comes in the first part, which is that that level of uncertainty feeding through to the economy, at least in the immediate term, has not actually been as significant as, as potentially would be, which showed that the economy was so it had a slightly more momentum, more momentum um, through the start of 2016 than had, had been thought, and the economy was slightly more resilient than had been thought in there. And the sharp dr drop in depreciation in sterling has also fed through to some positive impacts um, on, on exporters. So I think that's the kind of key positive thing that I would, that I would um, focus on. Thank you. <laughs> now we've got through the I, I am jolly experience. <laughs> um, Patrick, not that you're going to be any worse. Uh, to be honest, I think Willie Coffey's voice sums up the way a lot of people feel about everything 2016 has thrown at us already. So, um, good morning, uh, Professor Wright. Um, a few of us wanted to come on and talk about distributional impacts and the, the social justice impacts. I'd like to try and link toward that from the discussion that we've been having about debt and productivity, though. Um, assuming that at some point the UK government does get to the point of uh, a, a surplus and start reducing public debt, um, and you've acknowledged that there's a debate about whether that's advisable or not in principle, um, is it fair to say that if there hasn't also been a significant increase in productivity, that that reduction in public debt can only lead to increased uh, levels of private debt in the economy? Yeah, so... Uh, unless unless they continue to cut through public expenditure or or increasing in tax revenue, so the way that you you reduce the debt is obviously either through growing more quickly on the productivity side or actually continue to to cut there and I guess there's where does that growth come to reduce that overall debt? It either comes from becoming richer and able to pay off more or it actually comes from either further cuts or increases in debt in, a, in somewhere else and that could come through higher levels of of private sector debt um, and sorry 
story that we've seen since the financial crash is a mm. significant increase in household consumer debt. Uh, by yep. one estimate, it's gone up by 65% since the, the pre-crash mm. levels, and a lot of that will be about the people who have been cut, uh, have been hit by the austerity uh, decisions that have been made, whether that's in terms of uh, pay levels, whether it's in terms of uh, having the you know, basic needs met, uh, whether it's in terms of... Um, uh, of uh, austerity cuts on the, the, the welfare side, uh, and that private debt is more expensive debt than, than public debt as well. Is there anything that the Fraser of Allender Institute can do to give a clearer picture about the impact that that's going to have uh, uh, any further increases in private debt uh, on uh, not just social justice uh, uh, arguments, but also on the condition of the economy? Um, we, we often think about that distributional impact purely in terms of the direct changes in tax and welfare rates. Uh, but you know, when, we, when, we, when we push people further into desperation, we also push them further into private debt, uh, and that will be more expensive for them in the long run. Yep. Um, it's, a, it's a very good point, and um, I think it's definitely something that we'd be really keen to look at. Uh, and it's probably an argue a weakness in a lot of the discussion that you have around the outlook for the public finances and that it focuses on the public finances and it doesn't think about what the wider implications are from the economy. And you see some of the unintended consequences of that. So, uh, you know, debt being pushed off into bal off balance sheet and then coming back on balance sheet. Um, so things like, you know, the Bank of England's asset purchase facility, et cetera, now coming on to the public sector balance sheet. So that's one that's, that adds about, you know, 10% to GDP. Um, and there's a whole debate in there about generally what what is the ultimate debt of the economy. And at the moment, we always tend to focus on the public finances. So I think the point is really well made that actually it's not just about looking at the debt on the public sector side of things, but also the private sector side of things. Public debt. Yeah. Oh, aye. By by a by a massive amount. Yeah. And um, I think the point that you then get into, I think, is really is really crucial as well. In that one of the implications that you saw coming from the autumn statement was the slower growth is really coming through lower productivity, which in turn leads to lower earnings. And with higher inflation, that creates a really quite dangerous cocktail of real, relatively slow growth in real earnings which in turn feeds through to um, relatively low levels of household income, which in turn puts pressure on households. So in turn, you're right, potentially leads to higher levels of private sector debt, which are essentially all ignored from, from this sort of analysis that we currently do and um, that, we do, that we, do el we, we do elsewhere. So I think linking that, how this all feeds through to what's happening on the private sector side of things, both in terms of the distributional impact, but also the debt impact will be something that that's a really good suggestion that we'll look at. Thank you. Um, and, and then moving on to, to the, the impact of the, the direct changes in the autumn budget statement in terms of, of how those are distributed throughout society. Uh, I've got a couple of um, charts in front of me. One is from the Women's Budget Group, uh, demonstrating that not only uh, the impact uh, is more severe on the poorest third, uh, least severe on the richest third, but that also at, at every level uh, throughout the income distribution, the impact is more severe on women than it is on men. Uh, and I've got another chart here from the Resolution Foundation looking at the, the distributional impact prior to the autumn statement, so the, the 2016 budget, and then comparing that with the, uh, the changes in the, the autumn statement. And those changes in the autumn statement are really, really marginal compared with the, the hit that people were already taking uh, either in terms of tax and benefit policies uh, through the, the 2016 budget, uh, with uh, admittedly people in the top decile uh, a little bit worse off, but only a, by a tiny proportion of their actual income. Uh, the rest of the, the top half uh, of the population significantly better off, uh, and the deepest cuts uh, coming to the poorest third of society. Uh, is, is that a, 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 an assessment that you would recognise and, and endorse this coming from the Resolution Foundation? Uh, and I guess the, the ultimate question is, what can we do about it uh, with the, 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 the choices that are available to us in the Scottish budget? Is it possible for Scotland to change that line at all uh, and make a, a more significant impact uh, in terms of uh, protecting those who have been 
hit so hard by UK government decisions? So I, I don't have these specific charts in front of me, but I, re I recognise the, the various bits of analysis that, that people have done. Um, obviously, it depends upon what your starting point is about when who wins and who loses, etc. And where do, do you start from the start of the consolidation period or do you start from this autumn statement and things? But I think what we do know that over the next few years, you're right in that the autumn statement didn't really contain too much new measures around changes in welfare or changes in taxation that would have an impact on the lowest people the, the people in the lowest part of the income distribution the households in the in the in the lowest parts of the parts of the income distribution but what we, we, what we did know was going to be crucial going forward was the freeze to to working age benefits as being the key driver of what would be the the challenge for these for that part of the income distribution over the course of the next few years and with higher inflation that makes that challenge um, even harder if you then add on top of that earnings now predicted to be slightly slower than they would have been um, I, and then earn, inflation eroding that as well you then do have quite a pinch point over the next few years in that kind of group w within society facing the, the full impacts of higher inflation on their earnings, but also the full impacts of inflation on a freeze in working age benefits coming through. What the Chancellor did do was a lot of speculation that he might do something to address that. What he did do was change, you know, make a minor change to the taper rate at universal credit. It is a relatively minor change in comparison to all the other changes that had been planned to, to save some money. And it also doesn't really kick in till further, you know, quite a bit further down the line. We know that the rollout of universal credit keeps on being delayed. So um, any changes to universal credit are not likely to have an immediate impact on the vast majority of people receiving working age benefits until toward the end of the of the forecast period. So um, I haven't seen these charts. I don't have these charts in front of me, but that kind of analysis is consistent with what we, what we would conclude as well. Um, you then get into what policies can the Scottish Government do to, uh, to mitigate that. Um, there's obviously a lot of debate about what you can do around personal allowance and can you set a 0% rate on top of that to increase the personal allowance. To be honest, that's not really a tax policy that impacts on the people in the lowest part of the income distribution because you know you, um, uh, most people there are, are, are not paying income tax at that point because of the various deductions etc that come off so it has much of a, a much of a less blunt part of it i think what we do know is that um people in different parts of the income distribution use certain types of public services more often than than others and i think that that's potentially the way to to look at what mitigating action can you take around use of public services to, to, to support um, different parts of people in income distribution. Local government is crucial to that. Um, we know that ultimately the local government in the end picks up quite a lot of the anti-poverty measures, quite a lot of the implications in terms of education and so on. So there's potential ways there that you, the government might want to look at how they could potentially utilise offsetting some of the some of the impacts by directing resources to the public services that the Scottish Parliament controls um, and combating it that way. It's interesting you mentioned that the personal allowance is one option. The, the, the very next uh, graph on this Resolution Foundation report uh, demonstrates that the change to the personal allowance uh, in itself, 85% uh, of the benefit of that goes to the richest half of the population. Uh, and so again, this, this notion that increasing the personal allowance is a is a socially progressive measure, I think, doesn't stand up to a lot of scrutiny. Uh, yeah. And I, I wonder whether you know we would be able to have a, a more positive impact on this 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 curve about you know who's benefiting and, and who's uh, carrying the, the greater burden if we were willing to look at the the tax rates rather than the allowances and thresholds uh, re and reduce it for those on a, a below average income uh, and be willing to increase it for those who can afford to pay more. Yeah, so I mean, you're right. The the personal allowance essentially benefits uh, it benefits individuals. So you have you know it doesn't in any way impact on, on on a household basis. So in turn, the vast majority of the impact hits, hits through to the the higher parts. Um, I guess really what you're talking about doing is potentially what you might do with the rates to potentially raise income and to in turn feed through to use of public services, that's that's one way to do it. Um, whether you could cut rates, for example, to boost um, incomes of, of you know, marginal households, again, it comes back to the point about personal allowance. If your focus is on um, the households most impacted by the welfare cuts and that the, in, in the first few deciles of the income distribution, 
then again, change, cutting tax rates is not likely to impact you know, on, on, on that group. And in fact, if you cut, the, say, the basic rate, then that will benefit everybody. So you, you've got to be careful about how you use the rates as well. Um, you only have one basic rate as it stands at the moment. Exactly, yes. Which isn't um, required under the, the new powers. It's not. Um, I guess my point is really that if you're really focused on the households and the first few parts of the income distribution, cutting the rates or changing the allowances is not likely to have too much of a direct impact on them. It's what you do with the resources on the public spending side to target towards them that could be, that could be most crucial. Okay, thank you. Marie, sorry, I was taking my help to get to you a bit. Yeah, no, I think, and I think you've covered most of uh, what I was going to ask very well. Thanks very much. Um, I, I wonder, I, our job here in the Finance Committee is to scrutinise the Scottish Government, so we try to match up, I guess, policy aims with um, spending and, and, and see how that works. It's not particularly our job to scrutinise the UK government, but I'm absolutely struck by what, we, what you've just you know, said there about how the hardest hit people will be the poorest in society and the working class families and those in low income. How does that match up with a promise to be a government that delivers for working class families? Well, it's kind of slightly... I don't really want to comment too much on a UK government policy and things, and I think the UK government will probably have quite a strong answer and be able to articulate an answer back to you on that. Um, I guess the Chancellor does face a difficult balancing act between growing the economy, and their view will be is that a faster-growing economy and economy that um, has stable public finances in the long run will be the thing that will be the most important for... You know, boosting growth across the economy. But that, that's really a political argument, and whether you agree or disagree with that, that's ultimately a choice that, that, that they would make. I mean, I think our focus will be on the analysis around that. So who, who is impacted most by the, the autumn statement um, is the kind of focus that we would do. Whether that's the right or wrong decision, the, good, the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it, then that's ultimately a political choice. There's clearly going to be some people who are imp impacted very severely next year when inflation peaks. Yeah, so I mean, that is, you know, in terms of that, yes, we know that the the big thing that is pretty much guaranteed. I mean, obviously, there's lots of things about the forecast that are quite, you know, uncertain, etc. But when you have a 15% depreciation in your currency, then you know that that will feed through to higher import prices, which in turn will feed through to higher inflation, which in turn will have an impact on will have an impact on housing, uh, different different households. And uh, when you choose to freeze working class working age working age benefits then that has you know an impact on 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 people more than it would otherwise be the case because inflation is is higher pensioners on the other hand for example are more protected because they are linked to overall inflation so you get some you get some differences in distributional impacts and ultimately it comes down to the choices and, and what you want to do with it Thank you. i think dean you're a supplementary in there it's a related but slightly different point. Th th thank you. Um, the Chancellor said one of the measures he, he will look at going forward is budget deficit as a percentage of GDP. And uh, I believe at the UK level it's currently 4%, with a target of reducing that below 1% by the end of, end of the Parliament. Um, looking at, uh, in, in the Scottish context, <coughs> the latest GERS numbers show a notional budget deficit in Scotland of around 9%, I believe. Um, what impact will the budget deficit and additional borrowing powers coming to Scotland, what impact would that have on the notional level of budget deficit in, in Scotland? Would you expect that 9% number to increase or, or decrease over, over time? I always love a question in GERS. Um, yeah, so essentially, so essentially the way, as you know, the way GERS works is essentially it, um, it assigns Scotland uh, expenditure in Scotland an estimate of revenues in Scotland, and then a share of equivalent UK uh, expenditures as well. So any movement in the UK deficit, either up or down, will feed through to the Scottish budget up or down. And um, so if the UK government continues to um, uh, cut the fiscal deficit, then uh, you would expect the Scottish fiscal deficit to, to, decline, as, to decline as well. Um, obviously, then within that, you get all the debate about you know, relative shares of oil and all that kind of stuff, what might happen there. But just purely on, if you take the onshore economy, if the UK deficit is falling, then the Scottish deficit would fall as well. But that would be subject to additional borrowing by the Scottish Government if it used its new powers to, to, to borrow? So, well, 
the, the number you're talking about in terms of JERS, in terms of you know the nine percent, etc., is essentially uh, the, the 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 notional Scottish position um, within the UK context. It doesn't really have too much to do with the Scottish position under the, the fiscal framework. If the Scottish Government were to increase borrowing, capital borrowing, then that would add to the overall public expenditure in Scotland. But it, in the context of JERS, it's kind of slightly irrelevant in that context, because ultimately the Scottish Government doesn't run a deficit. It essentially has a balanced budget. Um, and the JERS is a kind of a slightly different concept of what a, f a f fiscal position might be um, uh, for Scotland you know, overall. Can I just change the, the focus just a little bit, um, Professor, uh, from being about the, the budget um, from the Chancellor and how we might deal with it in the Scottish context to much more an issue about um, this committee and Parliament and dealing with budgets? Because I think there's a, a crucial issue given that the autumn statement included an announcement that the UK budget will now move to, to the autumn as the main fiscal event. Um, and in terms of the timescales involved in that, it obviously puts significant pressure on well, not just the, the Scottish Government, but the Scottish Parliament, and how we might deal with them, the ramifications of that change. Do you have any uh, views about how the operation and framework of the budget scrutiny of the Parliament might be? Therefore, it's, it's going to need a... Well, frankly, I mean, we, we were talking about big change before under the Budget <laughs> Review Group. I think we're now talking about a radical change it's going to have to be to deal with this. So, on the one hand, the fact that the main budget statement will be in the autumn, I think, is in some ways is helpful in that regard. So, you won't have a situation where the Scottish budget is set, it goes through the process in January or February, and then potentially you could have major fiscal changes by the UK government in March, you know, less than a month ahead away from when the Scottish budget would kick in. So, on that part of it, I think it's, I think it's a positive in that regard. I think where the challenge comes in is. Um, when will the autumn statement be in the autumn? Um, I, the, the definition of autumn in the civil service seems to range between um, July to December. Um, and I think that will be the crucial point. Um, my, my assumption would be is I think it, uh, my assumption would be I wouldn't expect it to be that early in the autumn. If you think about when the UK Parliament returns, you know, is later than the Scottish Parliament, you then have the UK party conference season, which will be kind of October. So, you, you know, you, the starting point would be is you might not think it might not happen until sometime in, in, in potentially in November. So I think there's a challenge in there because that then immediately means that there's going to be some, some quite challenges about when the Scottish budget would be and the ability of the Parliament to scrutinise it. Um, two things I would say around that. I think that if the autumn statement is going to be in the autumn and is a major budget event, then it probably does make sense for the Scottish budget to come after that, given that that's when the block grant adjustment will be. Um, but I would then you know, caveat that with, with a number of points. One is um, I think that the a lot of information can be provided in advance of actually the finalisation of the budget. So there's a lot of detail that could be provided in the run-up to whenever the, the Scottish budget is, is done. I think secondly, there's something about the, there's obviously the importance of the timing that goes to scrutiny, but there's, I think the key thing for me is the quality of the scrutiny. And I know that's the st sort of stuff that the Budget Review Group are looking at. And I think I'm coming to speak to them in the next couple of weeks around that. But it's about what is the level of information that underpins the Scottish budget? What are the... How, transparent are the assumptions that go into it, how transparent are the various elements of portfolio spending, so that if the budget scrutiny period is slightly shorter than it has been in the past, then how can you actually just improve the level of scrutiny that goes into it without actually having to try and find lots of different material from different places? So I think with that, it throws into some, some quite significant issues about not just the timing, but the quality of the scrutiny, because if it is going to be constrained in timing, then we need to improve the quality. Well, the Auditor General suggested to us the need for a, a medium-term financial strategy from the, the Scottish Government. If, if that was to become a feature of the process in Scotland, in, you, in your view, what level of information do you think would need to be in that financial strategy to allow that um, scrutiny to be t to undertaken at an appropriate level? Um, so I would say there's two things around that. One is I think it, you, you have to move beyond one-year budgets. Um, and point Murdoch was making around the fact that the, the budget next year is going to rise in real terms. 
I think there's a danger that that, in a sense, pushes back some of the difficult decisions that have to be made, because if you only publish a one-year budget, then that essentially is kind of hidden to an extent. So um, I think, you've, at the very least, you need to be setting out budgets up to the end of the up to the end of the, the Parliament. And what the OBR do is that they essentially have a rolling forecast period. So every time they come to an update, they add an extra year on. And I think that is ultimately crucial. So you should be looking at five years out for your forecasts, not just on your spending elements, but also on your revenue elements as well. There will obviously be uncertainties about that, but I think that there's actually uh, an advantage in just being upfront about the uncertainties, as the OBR have done this time, being clear about you know the, where the various expenditure pressures are going to be. I think that part of it is you know where we need to move to in the budget process, just an acceptance that you need to have multi-year budgets to help planning, etc. The second part is about what do you do about the medium to long term challenges around the budget. And I think the Auditor General, Auditor General is, is quite right in that we know that particularly things like demographics will start to have quite a significant impact on pressures on certain elements of, the, of public spending over the next few years. So there was a number again in the OBR where they're talking about that the deficit would be about 0.8 percentage points higher in the mid-2020s because of demographic pressures there. So that's quite a significant increase in, in spending that we needed to go to that. So it, again, it would be really helpful, particularly on where you're making commitments to say, for example, protect the health budget in real terms. What does that mean in a context where you've got an aging population and you know, how can you forecast that ahead? What might be the pressures that come further down the line from, from uh, you know, medium to long-term uh, implications? Thank you. Do you have any supplementaries in that area? In that case, Professor Roy, thank you for coming along and giving us a, with a very interesting session this morning. Um, I, I now suspend this meeting to allow a change over of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Um, the, the third item on our agenda today is to take evidence uh, of our part of our taxation inquiry from Yvonne Evans from the Tax Law Subcommittee of the Law Society of Scotland, Alan Barr, who's a partner at Brodie's and an honorary fellow at Edinburgh University, but you're speaking mainly to the Alan in a personal capacity, and Professor David Bell, who's a fellow at the Royal Society of Edinburgh. I, I very much warmly welcome our witnesses this morning. We've received papers from each of you, which we're grateful that you've sent to us. I know that committee members have had these. Um, if, there's any, if there's any particular question directed at one particular witness, don't feel restricted by that. If you want to contribute, let us know. We'll try to make this as free-flowing as we possibly can. I don't know if anybody wanted to make an opening statement. Of... OK, we'll get straight into questions. Uh, and Adam Tompkins. Uh, thank you, Convener. I should say that I'm also a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, but I'm not part of the working group that, um, that David Bell's been um, the, the part of. Um, I wanted to start with the suggestion um, that is very strong in um, Alan Barr's evidence, but I think it was also in the RSE and other evidence, <coughs> that um, the use so far um, of devolved fiscal powers has been a bit disappointing and a bit lacking in imagination. And I, I wondered, first of all, if you all agreed with that, and if you do, whether you think that it's more a reflection of a sort of failure of political imagination on ministers' part, or is it um, perhaps more disturbingly a, a, a reflection of a lack of capacity on the Scottish Government's part? Um, I think uh, it's a combination of the two. I think in, in the end it's a matter of practicality, uh, is that in relation to the devolved taxes, there was a necessity to get legislation onto the statute book and to start collecting the tax. Uh, and that is a long and difficult process, and therefore the understandable main route was to work on the model of the UK taxation that was there. In other words, to take the prime tax raising tax that is directly, it's wholly devolved at the moment, um, land and buildings transaction tax, it was based entirely on an SDLT model, and it was therefore understandable that it should be taken pretty well from the UK model. Now, so therefore it was the kind of, I wouldn't necessarily start from here, but they did start from there, and I can understand the necessity of doing so. In order to do it differently um, would have required a much, much greater preparatory effort in terms of economics of what it would raise, in terms of would it be attached to transactions at all, for example, or should it appro approach this from an entirely different angle? Now, that is harder and takes more time, so I can understand why it was done. Was it possible to do it differently? Yes, of course, but I can fully understand why it was not. Uh, I just make uh, um, one point, really, uh, uh, in addition to that, is that, is that I think one of the principles around um, a... Uh, well-functioning tax system should be that of transparency and, and really we shouldn't expect things to change very rapidly um, if we move away from the current Westminster model of changing taxation at relatively short notice without wide and uh, informed uh, consultation before that happens. Uh, then you do run the risk that, that the tax system uh, loses uh, some credibility. So um, I, wasn't, I haven't been particularly concerned. You know, a small change has been made in the structure of LBTT, but um, uh, we certainly uh, are of the view that, that a um, transparent structure as far as uh, the approach to taxation uh, is concerned would involve a wide uh, consultation and you can't expect that to result in very rapid changes in tax structure. I think we agree with that. You know, we don't want change just for change's sake. We've, if there's going to be change, we want it to be considered, carefully thought out, and perhaps um, slow change is easier to manage because we're certainly looking at certainty as a very important principle. Um, in tax, so it's perhaps more manageable to start small um, with tax. So there's a power um, on the statute book, section 80B of the um, Scotland Act 1998, which is not a Smith Commission power, it's a Calman Commission power. It was enacted in the 2012 uh, Scotland Act. It's been in force since the 1st of July uh, 2012. Um, it's a power to create 
new taxes of power in this parliament to create new taxes. Um, it's never been used. Nobody ever talks about it. Should it be used? Should we talk about it? Would that be a way of having a more imaginative discussion about fiscal devolution? Certainly, the, the easiest thing in terms of, of more imaginative solutions would be to start from, from a, a new taxation base. Um, and, and then you wouldn't be trammelled by the Westminster model, uh, either in the form of legislation or for what it was attempting to tax. Um, the, the slight danger of that in taxation for taxation's sake, you know, we've got a new toy in the box, so we are going to use it. Um, and, and that to me seems equally dangerous, but, but that would be possible if there was a policy or economic desire um, to tax a particular thing. Now, the policy of simply raising money uh, may not be enough. Tax is much used as an economic lever, um, so it could be done for both of these reasons. Uh, but again, I can understand why it is not, because it's hard. These things are difficult. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree that uh, that we should be opening up the debate. We've had that opportunity for some time to discuss um, uh, the structure of taxation in Scotland. We we can't do that uh, without recognising that we are part of a uh, an existing structure for as far as the UK is concerned that is incredibly complex, and and finding a way through that to uh, determine. Uh, you know, a different path for Scotland is in itself not something that can be done quickly or lightly. One thing I, that I would add uh, that, to that, though, is, is actually we don't discuss charges very much either, which, uh, which is uh, uh, an important... Taxation and charging for services shouldn't be seen as completely distinct uh, uh, entities. For example, we do charge a lot for long-term care, uh, local authorities do charge a lot for long-term care, and there are taxation alternatives to that uh, that particular uh, charging route. But those issues seem to also have n not really be all that uh, uh, high profile in the public discourse in Scotland over the last few years. I think we support um, all of these comments. Um, on new taxes or um, amendment of existing taxes, we can point to plenty of problems with existing taxes, um, individual taxes that if um, the Scottish Parliament did get hold of, there's an absolute opportunity to reform for the better. Um, in terms of the whole tax system, though, it does absolutely add complexity if we have extra or different taxes in Scotland for taxpayers. I think it's a policy thing to start with. You have to decide whether taxes are to be used as a means of discouraging or preventing people from doing things by making them more expensive, or alternatively, is there is an opportunity, governments need money, and therefore there is a source of money that can be raised, and um, that will be a, a, a reason for a new tax. But these are, these are separate considerations. Sometimes they happily coincide, but uh, uh, they are separate considerations. Oh, thanks. One more question from me, and do, do feel free to disagree with um, each, each other where, 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 you, where you want to. Um, uh, just in thinking about um, opening principles, general principles, um, uh, so far as I can see, nobody's mentioned the, the great constitutional principle that there should be no taxation without representation. Is that not a principle of um, Scottish um, taxation that we, t we should adhere to? And if it is, then I suppose one question is, what's the justification for business tax when businesses don't vote. Um, uh, and another question is, you know, are, are we confident that we've got right the relationship between um, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the tax base and the definition of Scottish taxpayer um, and effective representation in Scotland? Um, right. I, I, don't, I don't think I agree with you on the... the, the the businesses don't vote because the owners of businesses do vote. The shareholders, the employees, all of the the, um, the the people who economically derive benefit from businesses do have votes. It, it is hard to see how you would give entities a kind of super vote, perhaps, for their representation uh, in any kind of working form of democracy. So, I, I mean, I think that on that constitutional question, we're as good as we can get. If, Entities don't have separate votes, so therefore don't have direct representation. Um, 
in terms of the Scottish taxpayer base, um, this is difficult. I mean, in a in a mobile with a, with, without hard borders, it's extremely hard to tie this down. The one thing that comes as a surprise to me, and it's it's not possible within the current devolution settlement, is that um, rental of land in Scotland um, will be taxed according to the location of the taxpayer, not. The land, um, and that strikes me, given particularly other policy initiatives in uh, in relation to land in Scotland, that is somewhat anomalous in these circumstances. Um, uh, but otherwise, um, the tax is tied to the person rather than the place. Uh, the person then has to be tied to the place in some method or another. Um, my difficulty with how it has been done would be for a pretty small number of people it is uncertain. Um, for most people, it is very certain they have one home location. That will define them as Scottish taxpayers or otherwise. For a very small number of people, but probably ironically, the people who have the most to gain or lose by flexibility, then there is uncertainty attached to it. And the definition adopted is the slightly woolly um, definition that's, that, that is... Um, home for a Scottish tax, but it's actually it's carried over into an element of the LBTT legislation as well, which, which I find um, somewhat strange um, because it is a, a rather vague definition, basically surrounding where your home might be. Um, so that taxpayer base may change in due course. I would agree with that as well. The definition of home is inconsistent across different capital taxes, LBTT and, and many different taxes and charges so um, it would be helpful to think about that carefully what do you want what are you trying to achieve with this and is the tax actually achieving that thank you you got a supplementary on this project uh, i a supplementary on, on adam tompkins question yeah um I, and i'm glad adam has given us all permission to disagree with him uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll i'll bank that for the long term uh, if that's all right Confirmed he isn't supporting votes at 16 of those <laughs> effectively in these statements. Well. well, you know, I, I was surprised at the <laughs> idea of um, giving giving votes to, to, to businesses. That sounded uh, more like a 2 a.m. Donald Trump tweet uh, than, than something from <laughs> than something from the from the usually calm and, and intelligent uh, <laughs> professor. But he was very much right to say that there are pre-existing tax powers that have never been used. And it goes back, actually, to 99, because the Scottish Parliament has always had the ability to levy uh, a very wide range of taxes on, on any tax base it wants, so long as that tax is being raised for local services. Uh, and there's been a, a reluctance to get beyond the general acceptance that council tax is a bit rubbish and a bit of a broken system, uh, a reluctance to go beyond that uh, consensus and actually take, take action. Um, is it worth suggesting that underlying all of what we say publicly, there is an unspoken principle, an unspoken principle, which is that we do, uh, that we take the path of least resistance uh, and we do what's politically uh, easiest? Uh, you know, I know that we're going to get on and discuss what the actual principles ought to be, but is there an unspoken one? Uh, that's actually preventing political action from being taken, even when everybody agrees privately that it's necessary? Um, I'm inclined to agree with you. Um, I have uh, the uh, Birch Review, um, which uh, I did the analytical work for, uh, and the conclusions thereof were dismissed before they more or less hit the, uh, hit the uh, press. Um, so um, I, th I do think that, and, and subsequent events in relation to the council tax have suggested a very, very small C conservative approach uh, to its reform. Um, and I, you know, this, this is a political problem. It's not. It's not. It's not, it's not an economic problem. But it, it seems to me that that. Um, uh, Scotland hasn't been all that radical in terms of its approach, particularly to the taxation of property. I think also this, there is a danger with any taxes that they are simply new taxes grafted on to the existing system. And I think that to be truly radical and to get acceptance, that would really require a starting point of what are we going to get rid of? 
before we come up with something new, before we insert something new. And to do that is really difficult because you have to calculate exactly what you've got in terms of what that raises, see whether you need more or less from what's going to replace it, and in political terms, see um, which particular geese are going to squawk loudest because there may be more feathers taken from them than was the case under the previous system. Now, all of that is really difficult stuff. And the, the temptation, if you've got taxing powers, including to introduce new taxes, is simply to let's put a new tax on eating peanuts or fizzy drinks or something else that... that it does of its political reasons. Now, that creates a layer of additional complexity in what is the most ridiculously stupid complex tax system in the world. And at the moment, the Scottish element of that is just another layer of complexity for people who are in Scotland. And you could add local authority, residents of particular local authorities. If that was to be used radically, that may be yet another layer of complexity in a fundamentally stupid tax system. And a Scottish addition to the stupidity just because we can doesn't seem a very good way forward. Uh, think <laughs> <laughs> the suggestion was that Scotland actually has not been tempted to make changes. You, you say it's a temptation to add more complexity. Uh, given the, the, the scope of, of devolution from 99 onwards, it seems to me that there's been very little uh, giving in to that temptation. Uh, in, in fact, we've we've retained outdated and, and dysfunctional systems instead? Whether they're outdated or dysfunctional, I think they've been retained because you, you mentioned the path of least resistance, I think, and that, that, is, that is understandable because to, to make different decisions <coughs> is hard and requires a lot of preliminary work. And, you know, this is not that old a parliament to have done that necessary preliminary work. I'm going to come to Marie Todd in just a minute, but something that strikes me as a real tension here in terms of the, the ability to us to make these radical reforms, and obviously the biggest area of tax take we'll have um, for the foreseeable future will be an income tax. And everybody in their papers are talking about low compliance costs, procedural fairness, transparency, keeping compliance costs low, etc. Um, but in that, to, to create radical reform and income tax, how feasible is that when the HMRC will continue to be actually the administrators of that process mm -hmm. and any radical reform would require the Scottish Government putting significant money up front to pay for that change um, from HMRC. So in the income tax area, how radical, is, you know, how radical can we be in terms of these issues in reality? I think that, I mean, there are administrative costs that you, you rightly uh, uh, raised there. There's the interim... Um, mingling with the existing uh, uh, tax in the rest of the UK. So there may be behavioural response if, if, our, if, if we go for a radical change in, in the bans um, uh, and the rates. Uh, there's also the issue of the interaction with national insurance, which is in all but name another form of income tax. Um, and there's the fact that that possibly a lot of radical reform might be around the tax base and changing the tax base, which Scotland doesn't, uh, doesn't have control of. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 it seems to me that radical change in respect of this, our largest source of uh, revenue, um, should be thought of as a long-term venture rather than one that we um, embark on, uh, you know, relatively quickly without going through the necessary um, analysis, consultation, uh, and so on. I think it also must be recognised that at the moment, um, I mean, I actually don't think it would be that expensive to be radical within the current, current confines. In other words, there is complete control of rates and thresholds, um, but only complete control of rates and thresholds. So some of the other things that are talked about in relation to the tax base, in relation to aspects of, of defining a Scottish taxpayer, for example, these are not devolved matters. So I think it would be relatively 
cheap, whether it be desirable is an entirely different matter, it would be relatively cheap to be radical in diverging from the rest of the UK policy on income taxation. And I think that, you know, we are told that it would cost a lot more the greater the divergence. I think in terms of rates and thresholds, that is probably not true. And, and much more importantly, it will be just as expensive to make small changes to that than to make large changes in terms of administration. And indeed, in many ways, um, perhaps worse to make small changes because it loses transparency. So I think it is possible to be radical on these things within the devolved powers. To so say whether, whether that's desirable, given the mobility of the population, um, is, is a very different matter. Uh, but I think it is possible. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, you have very wide powers with the rates. You can do what you like with the rates, but that, as has been said, is only part of the story. It's not having control of the rest of the tax um, expenses, reliefs and so on is um, going to hold, hold you back, really, in terms of how you can shape and reform the tax more radically. And there was comment from some of the people as well about the people creating corporations to avoid income tax. Can you just talk us through about what the dangers are there are for us if that was to become a reality? Well, I mean, yes, it could be done, but this is a kind of constantly moving battlefield. And as a good example of the interaction, I mean, the, the way that it would work at the moment is that um, people could take income from their own company in the form of dividends, which is not liable and not capable of being liable at the moment under the current rules to the Scottish rate of income tax, however different that was. Now, whether that was worth people doing that, particularly there tend to be significant upfront costs in converting businesses to corporations from a sole trader or partnership status, whether it is worth doing that depends on the amounts involved. But it does illustrate the, the tension between the two systems. The taxation of dividends is an RUK matter. The taxation of earned income from the same company, from the same business, from the same underlying economic activity is within the confines of the Scottish Parliament. Who sensible is all that? Um, it, it's not particularly sensible, I would say, um, to have that amount of separation. It is understandable, perhaps, with fluid borders. Yeah, I mean, if, if I can just add other um, a tipping points that are a, a, of interest in relation to the yield of, uh, of income tax in particular. So you've got this incorporation issue. You've also got the employment, self-employment border, where, uh, where uh, people may be encouraged to uh, become self-employed, uh, even though in, in reality their behaviour is that very much that of or similar to that of an employee. And I think that's one of the reasons why, in the autumn statement, effectively the Chancellor was acknowledging that uh, income tax revenues have fallen way below expectations for, for, for this fiscal year. Uh, the other borders that are important are the hours border, so people work less uh, if, uh, as a response to higher income tax rates. The early retiral or withdrawal from the labour market border if people uh, respond adversely to higher income tax rate. And then, as already been mentioned, if you can, if you can move to a lower tax jurisdiction, uh, then some people may find it advantageous to take that route. Um, to, to, uh, for, uh, to avoid uh, higher rates of tax. Yeah, I would agree. Um, the, the tax system at the moment, it creates a lot of situations where taxpayers who seem very similar um, can be taxed quite differently based on things like employment status, as has been said. Um, so that offends the principle of horizontal equity, um, as it's known. Um, and th there is no clear policy reason for that, no justification that I've seen that, that really explains why that should be the case. And it does encourage taxpayers to choose um, tax motives for doing things in particular ways. Marie. I, again, I think that most of what I was going to ask has already been elucidated, so thank you very much. What I would particularly ask about is that question of people being mobile and able to change their residency. How confident would you be that the current arrangements with the HMRC would be able to be tight on that, in terms of identifying Scottish taxpayers? 
I think, I mean, I think that they are, you know, any tax system has to be used to identifying its, the tax connections with the people it wishes to tax. So there are levels of that already, for example, at UK residency. Are you a UK resident to start with, which is a kind of preliminary to whether you're a Scottish taxpayer? And I think that they are reasonable in, in, in policing that and their ability um, to police that. Um, in terms of identifying Scottish taxpayers or not, and I, I, think, I think I would stress the relatively small number of people who have a real choice in this. I think it is a relatively small number. Relatively the, they contributors. Are, yes, indeed. Yes, indeed, <laughs> they, they would be. Um, then um, I think that because, other than in a few cases, there is a, a move away from a very objective count the days, for example, test, that, that's going to weigh down the list of qualifying or disqualifying yourself as a Scottish taxpayer, um, then I think that these kind of vague notions may cause some difficulties for people who are effectively based in Scotland but are able to create a, a base elsewhere. Um, the extent to which it is policed depends on the resources put into it. Um, and, and you know whether and how soon people are prepared to challenge that position and get you know tax cases on the board so that people will know well if you do that then you'll not be a Scottish taxpayer and if you don't do that then you will. It would be quite short term um, gain anyway if you caught someone as Scottish um, and, and if they then knew that they were Scottish and then they could just counteract that by changing their practice so that they spend much more time in London or whatever it is that they've fallen down upon on the test. Murdo, I think you're a supplementary in this area. Yes, the discussion you were having is very interesting about um, tax distortions and also tax competition. There's quite a lot in the Royal Society of Edinburgh, a paper uh, about, about the interrelationship between taxes in Scotland and taxes in the UK, given we're in a single market and given the issues of fluidity we, we've been talking about. I mean, how much, how much evidence is there about the impact of uh, differential tax rates in a jurisdiction like the one we're, we're moving into. How, how much do we know about likely changes in behaviour? A little bit. Um, we, we know more at the international level than at the subnational level, and some countries seem to manage quite uh, successfully with quite different rates of income tax in localities uh, right beside each other. Uh, I guess Denmark might be an example of that. And, and you do get uh, uh, differences in countries like Switzerland and, and there, I think, but I would need to go back and check that the evidence uh, is, is less clear as to the potentially negative effects that uh, um, people taking actions for tax motives uh, uh, is concerned uh, uh, in, in, in that jurisdiction. So there's, there's a mixture of evidence. And my um, feeling about this is that uh, one has to be pretty wary about applying international lessons from other jurisdictions to the UK, or indeed to Scotland, partly because the UK has one of the most fluid labour markets in the world, evidenced to some extent by the huge increase in employment uh, over the last few years. Um, and whereas a lot of the, the 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 other the countries from which one might be drawing evidence don't have that level of, uh, of fluidity, and 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 that's very important uh, in relation to income taxation. I, I I can only kind of offer anecdotal professional evidence that what people do in response to tax rates is I think surprisingly limited at the edges. But if it is uh, what is regarded as a penal tax rate, then they will take action if it is possible to, to avoid it. So, you know, a, a differential um, of a pence uh, in the income tax rate might have very little effect. A differential of five pence, ten pence, um, 
and perhaps again ironically disproportionately at the relatively few people who are affected by this, is much more likely to have that kind of effect. That is, again, my evidence would come from, from capital gains tax, where um, people who end up paying a rate of 10% of capital gains tax because of very you know, uh, of rules allowing them to do so, are much, much more willing to say, right, we're not going to change our life, we're not going to move abroad for the necessary period to make that disposal, to do that kind of thing. They're not going to uproot themselves at that kind of level. Um, and whereas, whereas if it was higher, then they would and have do exactly that. I would disagree with that. Yeah. Just, 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 just one follow-up. I mean, given what you were saying, Alan Barr, was a while ago about the, the potential for a much more radical departure in terms of tax policy in Scotland from the rest of the UK, in reality, how much freedom of operation would any Scottish government have, given the issue that we've just talked about? That assumes that the taxation is always tied to the person rather than to other things. Consumption land, other things that are less easy to uproot. The person is only one connecting factor. It is the most important. Um, but there are other connecting factors, you know, location of business enterprises, location of companies. Now, some of them are, are in a way, silly, the kind of nameplate effect of, 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 of that on low taxes. Um, but, you know, others are, you can make a much stronger connecting factor than the person if you wanted to do that radically. I, I just say could, I'm not saying should. Okay, I'm trying to get back. And it's, we're covering quite interesting areas here, but the purpose of today was around the, the high, I think the principles and the high levels. So I'm trying to get back into that if I can. Um, Ash, uh, <coughs> then I'll come to James. Thank you. A number of your submissions mentioned um, the concept of simplicity, and um, particularly the Royal Society of Edinburgh submission. Um, you mentioned as well the UK tax code. Um, you mentioned it again just now about one of the most complex in the world. Um, I believe it runs to thousands and thousands of pages and as such, unfortunately, is also riddled with loopholes which allows people to kind of use the tax system to benefit themselves if they're able to. So I don't think anybody would probably be seeking to replicate that in Scotland, but obviously we're situated within that context. Um, we did take evidence recently from Revenue Scotland, obviously it's had its first year of operation, and many of the people that gave evidence said that they felt that it was quite simple, um, that it was easy to use, and there was good lines of communication and so on. So when you're mentioning simplicity in your submissions, are you talking about the tax code itself? Are you talking about maybe the operational side of it? Would you like to explain a little bit further? Uh, yeah, I think all of those things um, are important in simplicity. Um, it's not just about making the tax code shorter, um, that, that can be helpful in, in some ways. Um, it's about the way that the legislation is written as well can be helpful um, in reducing the need to then go and change the legislation um, to close off loopholes. Um, so I think uh, particularly Alan's submission has quite a bit on um, how you can frame legislation um, in a way that is almost kind of future-proofing it, um, stopping it from becoming even longer um, further down the line. Um, simplicity, we also mean in terms of um, administration, obviously, um, that's very important. That comes into um, efficiency as well. Um, so that, that's the ideal. Um, also for taxpayers, you know, should you have to go to a tax lawyer or an accountant to understand tax? I think that's a big issue in Scotland. It's something I'm quite evangelical about, about is taxpayers just don't understand tax. Um, and you know it should be more transparent. It should be more um, readily accessible to them. Yeah, uh, let me give you, uh, if I can, an, an example. I mean, and I think Revenue Scotland are absolutely right. For the vast majority of transactions and taxpayers, and I'll stick to LBTT. I think the system has worked well and is tolerably simple. What then happened? We got the introduction of additional dwelling supplement, and that creates, now is creating now, a range of uncertainties of things that people, including, I suspect, people who enacted the legislation, don't realise that it catches, that it shouldn't catch, and therefore they will do things to stop it catching. That's a, an absolutely classic example of you start with a tax that it taxes the purchase of a home, and I'm only dealing with the residential. Now, that is straightforward, it is simple, it is actually extremely hard to avoid, 
it meets, it ticks all the boxes. You then put a layer on the top of that and it becomes complex. It becomes more difficult to deal with. And that we have absolute evidence of that with the additional dwelling supplement now, even in our comparatively baby tax system that we've got. Um, and the other side of that that was always there, say the basic notion of purchasing property pay tax, when you move to more complex transactions, which involve uh, you know, multiple transactions or lease transactions or that kind of thing in the commercial world, which again has the additional point that, was, that, that came earlier, they also tend to be the ones that can or should produce large amounts of tax. That is where the complexity comes. So there's almost two distinct levels there. The, the, um, the basic is fine and can be kept simple. It is when it gets more complex, and the complexity sometimes comes from policy decisions, that you get, create the problems that lead to, if I had brought the entire UK tax code, you wouldn't be able to see me for it. it would, if arrayed in front of you, seven fat volumes of very, very closely printed pages. Um, yeah, um, Alan gives an example there where, when in effect, the, the uh, tax base has been uh, extended to, to some extent. Uh, I think our submission um, argued for uh, uh, wide tax bases that were easily understood where um, tax rates could therefore be kept lower and therefore would be less distortionary in terms of behaviour. And an example in the Merrilies uh, uh, re uh, review uh, concerns um, confectionery and uh, where you draw the line as far as confectionery is concerned as to that, what attracts VAT and what attracts doesn't, doesn't VAT. And I think I recall the, the eye decoration of, of, of a figure made in chocolate had something to do with the uh, with the definition of whether it attracted VAT or didn't attract VAT. So, uh, I mean, this is um, the kind of area where ev eventually people end up going to law because there are commercial interests involved and the whole thing, uh, um, dare I say it with two lawyers uh, beside me, uh, becomes, uh, you know, slow moving, and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, liable to uh, um, well, it requires clarity in the legislation. A point that has already been made. You almost go to that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you missed that expensive. Yeah. You would, uh, I didn't want to go. Yeah. I, I suppose. I see a sort of kind of a conflict there, though. If, if you're situated in an extremely complex system, as we are, and then you know, if you bring in. Uh, a replacement tax or a different tax, you are already adding to the complexity, even if your new tax is very simple and easy to use. So there's a tension there, isn't there? There is absolutely a tension there. There, there is absolutely a tension there. Um, but sometimes the complexity comes from the policy rather than from simplicity. Again, if I can give a, a, a UK example, well covered in the press, is in relation to film investment, film partnerships. We have all seen the, the tales of, of usually celebrities investing in this and getting quotes caught out by it. But of course, that started from an understandable drive to encourage actual investment in actual UK films. Uh, and it was only by, and I, you know, my profession is on the line in relation to this, of people saying, oh, well, we can exploit that differently because of the lack of simplicity of it, because you were able to construct things that were no longer the simple policy involved, and that led to people um, investing in that weren't really investing completely in the films, which was the original laudable intention. Um, so it's a question of where you start the policy from. Is it simply to raise money, or is it to do other things? Uh, and these are very different policy aims. Yeah, I'm sure also um, a lot of the um, exemptions and reliefs in the system, I know there's over a thousand, they, they were well-meaning at the time, you know, it's just become so clunky with so many of them. And of course, politically, once you put in relief or an exemption or an extension to something in place, it's very hard to claw it back politically. Ivan, I think you had a supplementary in this area before I came to James. So. Yeah, I, um, 
thanks very much for coming along and talking to us today. I, I, I suppose one of the benefits of this, um, talking about a subject like this, is it gives us a bit of space to get out of the day-to-day -day and look at the, the bigger picture, if you like. And I suppose the whole concept of principle is it's something that withstands the test of time. We're talking about Adam Smith's principles that have obviously been around for, for a wee while. Um, and clearly, if you look over the medium term, we've got a moving feast in terms of what's devolved and what isn't, and that's changed at least twice in the last three or four years, and I've no doubt it'll continue to change, and that's even before you start talking about the constitutional question. So I suppose what I'd like to do is kind of leave all that to one side and just go back to the principles. And the four principles that are there, um, do you um, do you think they're the right ones? Do you think there's some that shouldn't be there? Do you think that there's some that aren't there that should be there? And just for a kind of start for 10, we've talked about simplicity, which I think has got a, a huge bearing on, on at least three of those. Um, certainty, convenience and efficiency are all impacted by simplicity. And the other one I'd like just to throw on the table for your thoughts on is around about behavioural change. And we kind of talk about that, we often talk about that in a negative sense, how are people going to be mobile, etc. But clearly there's a huge positivity there in terms of you use it for consumption taxes on things that would otherwise cost your health service, or you use it to, to drive low carbon behaviour or to drive capital investment or to encourage people to employ people. There's a whole bunch of positive behaviours you can drive um, through the use of the, the tax system. Um, so yeah, just like your reflection on that, are the principles right? Should we have different ones? I mean, the, um, there's certainly a case to be made uh, for um, taxes that tax bads rather than goods. Um, there's a question of whether we all agree what are bads uh, and whether, you know, we feel that the state should be trying to influence our, our behaviour as to what it is that we consume or don't consume. I'm not saying that I'm on any particular side on that, but I think, I think the argument uh, uh, has to, uh, has to uh, be put there. Um, so certainly around the taxation of um, uh, uh, the use of carbon, there's been, uh, uh, you know, the UK has taken fairly strong action uh, in that in that respect, maybe it's rolling back on that on that uh, a bit uh, recently. But um, uh, in in general, uh, you know, I I don't have a problem, although there has to be a clear uh, consensus around. And again, this is where you know talking about consultation and uh, and transparency involving many stakeholders in the design of of, uh, of your tax policy rather than just a small uh, uh, number of people in what uh, uh, in your treasury or finance ministry or, or, or whatever uh, but the, the general principle uh, is uh, is uh, a, I think probably uh, uh, an acceptable one. Inevitably, there will be pushback by whatever commercial in interests are, uh, are maybe harmed uh, by this, but it may also uh, add to uh, innovation. Or you might force, uh, you know, um, airlines to uh, adopt more fuel-efficient uh, 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 planes, or as we've seen today. Uh, tobacco companies to adopt uh, less toxic uh, uh, cigarettes. So, you know, the, there is that uh, behavioural res response that you may uh, uh, get as a result of uh, 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 taxing uh, so-called bads, which, which is perhaps a good thing. I, I don't think that behavioural effects come into the principles as put forward. I mean, I, I, whether behaviour driving good behaviour, stopping bad behaviour should be another principle is something to argue about, but I think it would be additional. I, I, and to answer your original question, you know, do we think, do I think, I'm sorry, that these principles are reasonable ones? They're, yes, I do. I think they are. They may be limited, but I think that, and they're affected by other things. But I think proportionality, certainty, um, convenience and efficiency Pretty wide words are pretty good principles. I don't think that behavioural effects interact with those particularly well. So I think that if you want behavioural effects, stop doing bad, start doing good, then that would have to be another principle. And, and of course, we all would 
large numbers of us might differ on what were the goods and what were the bads, and what were also, within these other principles, the effective ways of stopping or encouraging them. Um, so I don't actually think the behavioural effects fit very well into a principled notion of taxation. In terms of whether we should have them, yes, I think that we should. And I think that, you know, these are as good as any. The, their long life, their long quoting over literally hundreds of years is indicative that they, they, they caught something pretty well. They're not complete, as, as you've just demonstrated, but I think they're a pretty good so start. Is there anything that you would add? I'm not sure that I would, because that gets away from one of them in the terms of simplicity and certainty. You know, um, four's enough. Could we get <laughs> one of them? That's could, the point. Could we get to three? Yeah, but it, but simplicity flows through yeah. quite a lot of them. No question. Um, yeah, just on, on the point about taxing on bads, I think um, don't think the Law Society has a view on this particularly. Um, there's one um, criticism of that is that it can be quite regressive, um, particularly if you're taxing uh, things like sugar um, drinks, for example. Um, that could be quite a regressive um, policy. Um, on the principles generally, I, I think, as Alan says, if, if you define these widely, particularly ability to pay, if you look at that in the round, then I think um, these do cover um, what you would be wanting in an ideal tax system. OK. James. Uh, thanks, convener. In terms of the submissions you've made, you know, you've, you've emphasised the, the themes of uh, certainty and efficiency around the tax system, and we've had a lot of commentary already today, um, both in the press and also at this committee, about the new income tax powers that, that have arrived. Um, I just wondered how the, the, the kind of system of allocation of income tax revenues to the Scottish budget fitted with those principles, bearing in mind that um, initially it's based on forecast numbers uh, and they, they then feed into the block grant adjustment and it actually takes 18 months before we get the actual figures and then it's into the next financial year be before, uh, once the reconciliation is completed and those numbers are actually allocated. So there's a there's a time lag between, there's much hype about these new powers today, but there's going to be a, 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 at least a two-year time lag between uh, the, the raising of tax revenues and the allocation of the precise figures to the Scottish budget. So how does that fit with those principles of efficiency and certainty? I guess we're... Um, th uh, those principles are... F based on the perspective of society as a whole. And, and, and the issue that you're raising is to do with the government's budgetary process and how that is um, maybe um, um, made more difficult uh, as a result of these time lags. And these time lags, I think, are inevitable given the structure of this tax that uh, the income tax that uh, is the main power that is uh, is being uh, devolved. So there's a question about forecasting and whether forecasting is accurate or not. And actually what we've seen recently is that the OBR have been very, very optimistic about income tax revenues uh, in particular. And, and therefore, uh, my feeling would be that, that um, whoever in the Scottish Fiscal Commission has to uh, look very carefully at, uh, at uh, uh, whether similarly optimistic forecasts for Scotland uh, uh, would, m would make sense in the future. But there are borrowing powers there to deal with the issue of, of, of um, a um, forecasts that go awry somewhat. They could go awry in either direction, of course. That, uh, 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 that's possible. But, you know, this is part of the implication of getting tax powers is that you have to take on additional risk. Uh, you know, uh, things could go better, things could go worse. But I think uh, we have to accept that with uh, new tax powers, uh, it has to be the case that, that uh, the Scottish Government's budget faces more risk than it, than it has done in the past. 
I mean, direct answer to your question, I don't think the process that you've described fits with these principles at all, but then nor can it be expected to. I mean, these principles are to do with the relationship between the taxpayer and the tax-raising authority, whatever that tax-raising authority is. Um, and the, the, the process of allocation is, as it were, after that stage has been reached. The, the goose has been plucked. What are you going to do with the feathers is the, the, uh, the extension of the analogy between the, the various pluckers of them. Um, and uh, the, the, um, uh, that is not something that I think that um, Adam Smith's principles can, can properly address. I mean, whether that process should be simpler and swifter is, is a matter of, of, you know, of course, of great concern uh, and importance. Uh, and it probably should, but if it cannot be, it cannot be. I don't know whether it can be or not. James, anything else? Yeah, yeah can I maybe just press David Bell a wee bit further? Um, I mean, these, uh, it's not just a question of numbers that end up in the budget, you know, that's pounds and pence, and this affects people's lives, you know, when you think, when you take it down to a level of a council, you know, potentially having to decide on a budget, you know, that that might impact on jobs and on services. Um, it, is there, I accept it's a complicated process, it's not straightforward. Uh, is there any, have you got any suggestions as to how the process could be speeded up um, to, make, to, to allow the accurate figures to be allocated to the budget uh, more quickly? Well, I think, I mean, the issue here is... Um to do with uh, uh, tax receipts and HMRC and partly to do with uh, uh, people who uh, submit tax returns after the year end um, sub, uh, and may not actually pay until 12 months after, effectively after the year end. And that inevitably introduces a um, delay so that, that you, before the, the full accounts uh, 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 can be drawn up. Whether that process can be speeded up, that really I don't know, you know, but probably HMRC couldn't do it uh, just for Scotland. It would have to be a change that would affect the, the, the UK as a whole, and I suspect that uh, there are many interest groups who would like to have the process as long as possible, uh, principally those who are ha may have to uh, pay up. Um, so uh, I think within the um, current constraints that HMRC are operating under, it doesn't seem to me that there's an obvious way to speed, the, to, uh, to speed this process up. Um, there may be ways of introducing more evidence, uh, you know, um, as uh, the period progresses. So, for example, could HMRC make all the PAYE returns uh, or the, their value uh, available to the Scottish Government so that at least it would have that part of, of the income tax information available to it and could do that almost immediately, I think. So, um, uh, at the moment, uh, I, I'm not sure how it can be done, uh, but there may be tweaks that, that might improve the system. But, you know, a borrowing facility has been put out there that is meant to cover errors, uh, ult uh, ultimately, that c could be derived from the forecasts. I yeah, understand what you're saying in terms of HMR HMRC. Once they complete their stage of the process, there's then, a, a, as I understand it, there's a reconciliation takes place around about the 18-month mark. Do you think that the, the, there's value in looking at how that could be um, carried out quickly in order that the allocations take place in that financial year instead of waiting to the next financial year, by means, say, of the autumn budget revision? There may be. I mean, I, I'm just thinking there may be ways of collecting survey evidence on uh, on uh, uh, people's uh, uh, income tax payments, almost in year um, calculations that that could be done in the way that we, we, I think we referred to the problems about survey evidence in relation to VAT. Uh, 
Uh, so maybe there's there's a way of collecting survey evidence in relation to both income tax and VAT. HMRC have an ambitious, some say too ambitious, program called Making Tax Digital at the moment, uh, which is which is directed at these uncertainties and the delayed payment of tax to, to some significant extent. Um, I, you know, this will take a while to bed in. As I say, quite a lot of people think that they are uh, a little bit ambitious in demanding this information up front. But one thing that if it, to the extent that it does come into effect, it will have the effect of both knowledge and perhaps payment being made much more quickly than the kind of delay that David was talking about that. So once that is bedded in, the information at least should be available from that particular source that earlier. That might then have a knock on, knock back effect, if I could call it that, on the kind of timescales of the necessity to wait for the end and then a time after the end because the information will be available earlier. Thanks. People want to ask questions. We've got about 20 minutes left. Willie. Mr. Convener, uh, I was hoping to maybe compli complicate things even more and talk about corporation tax. There's mention of it in Professor Bell's paper. Um, as you know, the UK was planning to give Northern Ireland, or may still be planning to give Northern Ireland, a reduced corporation tax rate. And then Brexit happened, and the UK kind of suggested that it might lower it anyway, which must have delighted our friends in Northern Ireland. Um, do you think there's a case, though, for a variable corporation tax system in the UK so that Scotland doesn't have a differential disadvantage between us and Northern Ireland if they inevitably get it? Uh, just corporation tax rate? I mean, if you... Well, so... Um, one of the um, things that we've already mentioned is, is, is the possibility of um, people doing things for tax motives and trying to uh, avoid that happening, uh, if possible, because it, uh, it, it will move economic activity from where it... it it may be most efficiently uh, uh, located to somewhere else. So um, Ireland, uh, the, the, the um, Republic, has got a very significant advantage economically in recent decades because it has managed to get people to move there for tax motives. Um, now, that leaves the UK in, in a somewhat uh, difficult uh, uh, position. But if the UK is going to reduce to 15% against Ireland's 12, the, the, the band between the two becomes fairly narrow. And whether it then becomes sufficiently narrow that uh, it, it becomes not worthwhile because obviously there are costs to moving. Uh, 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 location uh, uh, remains to be seen. I suspect that most uh, uh, countries don't think that corporation tax is one that is an ideal one to uh, a drop down to the uh, subnational level for particularly for that reason. Now, having said that, it does happen in in the states and. Uh, uh, and elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure what part of the space between 12% and 15% Scotland could advantageously locate itself. Um, so... It's not going below 17. So there, is, there is quite a differential advantage there for Northern Ireland, and particularly with Brexit happening, we would be at a further disadvantage, in my view, between Scotland and Northern Ireland if they had a something like a 12.5% rate compared to the Republic of Ireland, and we were stuck at 17. Well, again, the, um, I mean, we have lived with, uh, with, with this uh, uh, disadvantage for some time, and, and I guess um, well, there is some evidence that, 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 that companies uh, are certainly willing to move to Ireland. So, you know, whether, whether this Scotland would be similarly affected if it managed to uh, uh, have a, a very similar rate to uh, um, Northern Ireland, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of evidence, but, but it, I guess it is possible that that could happen. I think that it, corporation tax is, is, again, a difficult one because, of course, the location of the company 
is not necessarily the end of the story of where it, of, of the rate of corporation tax that it pays. Hence, again, the huge press coverage of Google and Facebook and, and these entities whose economic activity will is happening in very different places from where the company is in any legal sense resident. Um, so without the extension of powers to, to cover that, exactly what would you what would be taxed in Scotland would then ironically be open to the same kind of it's perceived as abuse of directing the profits to places where the, the, the rate might be less. Um, if, if that was possible to be done. So the actual uh, defining corporation tax by residents of the corporation is not is only part of the story, uh, and, and it may actually be the smaller part of the story, the greater the differential between rates. I mean, Northern Ireland think that they'll benefit well, by... We, sorry, we've gone quite a bit on that, Willie. Can, can I just see what Yvonne wants to... I think she wanted um, to... Well, what side do do, doesn't tend to make comments on rates in particular? I would say just... Um, generally agree with the points made. Um, tax competition, obviously, what you don't want to trigger is just a race to the bottom because then everyone loses. That's one thing to consider. Sorry, on you go. I, I mean, uh, what I'm reading here is that Northern Ireland think they'll benefit by £4 billion a year and 32,000 jobs if they get this reduced corporation tax rate you know, to help them compete with the Republic. Uh, so it seems to me that is, is, is there no advantage for us in having a similar model here, otherwise we could the reverse effect could happen here and we'll be in direct competition with Northern Ireland. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure where um, where these numbers come from. Um, uh, and, and as has been said, you know, it isn't necessarily the case that economic activity is associated with the location of, of, of the payment of, of corporation tax. So I'm not sure wh whether uh, at the moment, uh, that can be treated as a as a very credible set of statistics. Patrick, thank you very much. Uh, on another occasion, convener, there'll be time to challenge the the assumption that ever lower corporation tax is a benefit, or that decades of uh, of continual cuts to corporation tax have driven uh, the level of inequality that we see in society. But sadly, that won't be today. Um, can I just ask about uh, one comment in the RSE? paper uh, around the principle of proportionality. Um, the Scottish Government uses the term proportionality to the ability to pay, uh, and yourselves, as well as some other uh, written submissions, including from the Poverty Alliance, have talked about using it, the term distributional fairness instead. Um, and while I, I think I can see what's, what's the intention here, uh, I, I wonder whether the word fairness is also uh, open to criticism for being not sufficiently specific, given that quite a lot of very wealthy people think that it's very fair for them to dodge tax through every loophole they can manage. Yeah, I, I think we were we were a bit um, dubious about the term proportionality because it might be taken to imply a strictly proportional tax, which is not a progressive tax, and 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 that was uh, a, a concern. So. Um, in terms of equity, uh, ability to pay uh, is is a, a concept that is itself quite difficult to define, partly because uh, most people take it to be related directly to income, but, but that means, of course, that one is ignoring wealth, uh, which, uh, which is an important uh, component that, that people may have in terms of... Um, their ability to uh, uh, access goods and services. So, I mean, and then the, the question about how you uh, assess equity. Um, well, uh, I remember that you know the 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 budget, the Scottish budget, has an equalities impact assessment, um, and. So mostly we think about equalities in terms of indi the, their effect on individuals or households. But I think there's a case, as is the case in relation to the equalities uh, report, where you look at groups. So you might look at people by gender. You might also look at people by age group, which is not something that, that uh, I've got to say, the Scottish government has, has done all that much. Uh, in the past. So uh, I, I guess what we're 
arguing is that we didn't want, well, we were a little concerned about a strict taking of the, of the word proportionality and wanted to think about equity or, I guess, distributional equity would in, in the of, round. Would one way of framing this principle be uh, that the tax system should seek to reduce or limit wealth and income inequality? Well, that could be one of the objectives, uh, you know, a distributional, a distributional um, uh, motive for the tax system. It's, it's certainly there, but there are other uh, uh, objectives that, that tax systems typically do try to uh, uh, invoke. What, one of these might be uh, stabilisation. So you use the tax system to make sure that the economy is kept on an even keel. You might use the tax system to support growth. Um, so it, it is what... You could certainly argue that that's one of the key uh, uh, um, purposes yeah. so for the tax system. So the other principles, but just as a as a way of framing this question about proportionality. Yeah, Yvonne yep. mentioned it, something I hadn't heard of before, and the first person to mention it in that context about horizontal equity. So could, could you just maybe tell us a bit more about what lies behind that? Because that's slightly different, I think, from other things. So, that so that's about. where two taxpayers, let's say, with um, very similar amounts of income that they're getting, but one is a self-employed person and one is an employed person, you would expect um, under perfect horizontal equity that those people would be taxed in exactly the same way. And that's very much not the reality in our tax system when you look at both income tax and national insurance and how those two taxpayers are treated. We also have um, vertical equity as well, which mm -hmm. is to do with proportionality, um, not proportionality, um, progressivity in the system. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, I was going to come on as well and, and talk about um, some of the issues Ivan raised and which uh, Alan Barr had a discussion about uh, other objectives, other policy objectives, such as behavioural change being driven by, uh, by systems in, in taxation. Now, the, the efficiency principle relates, uh, as I understand it, to the idea that negative, uh, that, that the system should minimise negative effects on welfare and economic efficiency. Um, rather than adding an additional principle, which I think was Alan Barr's concern, surely the way to, to capture this is that we should be seeking to maximise uh, social, environmental and economic benefits uh, from the operation of the tax system. Would that not capture what's being sought without adding additional complexity? That sounds to me more like a policy than a principle. Uh, in the, the, the tax system may be a lever to do these things, but whether you want to do these things in a, in a principled way is determined by policy. And, that, and, and indeed what you said about wealth inequality as well struck me as, as a more policy-driven than principle driven. The, 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 the policy may well be to reduce wealth inequality, and that's a perfectly reasonable policy, but the principle on which that it should be done um, is much more likely to involve actual proportionality, for example, as, as a principle of doing so, rather than an absolute. Um, the principle is proportionality to the ability to pay. That also hangs on a, a, a policy assumption. That that it is a does, but thing. not necessarily of, of reducing wealth inequality. Because, because the, the, the fact that the richer or the, those with the greater income can pay a great deal more and should, under that principle, pay a great deal more does, does not mean that that necessarily will reduce, in any absolute sense, the inequality. David Bell's paper also gives an example of these other uh, objectives. Uh, the, the carrier bag charge is the one that's, that's mentioned specifically. I think very few people would disagree with the, the claim as well that uh, successive government's approach to taxation of cigarettes has been socially beneficial, uh, has been driven to achieve a, a change in behaviour uh, and, and not necessarily an increase in revenue. So it, it does seem to me that there's a, there's a question about um, the a question about the principle of the operation of, of the tax system that's implicit here rather than explicit. And it's simply a question of whether we should make it explicit. Uh, it also relates to, to uh, generality in the tax system rather than being 
raising specifically attacks from people who gain a benefit from a particular kind of public services. There are some people who would make the case for that kind of hypothecation. Uh, others would say it's important to the cohesive nature of our society that tax tends to be general rather than specific. Uh, I, I just wonder whether it's, it's important to get these principles uh, stated rather than having them hanging around in an unstated way. I, I have, uh, well, uh, that, good point, I think. You know, the, the issue of, of, of acceptability um, in terms of uh, behavioural effects of, uh, of uh, um, the taxes that one uh, might apply uh, does seem to me to be uh, imp an important area to keep bearing in mind. The, the, the issue of hypothecation is an interesting one because it seems to me that the political acceptability of, of certain ch changes in the tax system uh, that can be made, increasingly politicians think that, that that's only going to be acceptable if we hypothecate whatever extra revenue that, 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 w that we raise um, uh, to a specific public spending objective. Um, the, the UK Treasury has always tended to try to avoid hypothecation, basically because it argues that it ties its hands. Um, now, you know, it, it, the, there's, it seems to me there, is, there are serious dangers about having a large chunk of your tax system that are, is very specifically hypothecated to particular purposes. Who knows, through time, public priorities may change and, 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 and people may wish to do other things. In the short run, it probably you know, helps um, uh, the acceptability of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, changes to taxation. So for example, the increase in the council tax bans, the additional revenue from that has clearly been hypothecated to the education budget. Now, you know, um, that raises all kinds of questions that probably don't have time to go into into now. But you can see that 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 it carries political risk as well as uh, as, as potential uh, gain. Uh, I acknowledge that. Yep. To that, Alan, as well. I just. Um, no, all I, I was only to say. I, I, I think that we sometimes understate the pure revenue raising effects of of some of these behaviourally driven taxes. I mean, if if it, if they were entirely behaviourally driven, then taxes would be set at a prohibitive level. It would be aimed at stopping people doing things or restricting it to a very low level. And and the revenue raising of of the sin taxes, if I can call them that, and fuel and gambling and that kind of thing, is extremely important in in a mixed tax system. Um, and, and I think that that it may be slightly cynical to suggest it, but that revenue raising is an important part of what they're doing. Otherwise, if, that, if it's truly behavioural and they should be banned, they should be banned. Really quick one, then. I must get Dean in. Before. One, one oh. final question. I know we're tight for time. Uh, this is on the principle of, of transparency. Transparency, it seems to me, should not just be about how the system works, but what it's for as well. I think the only communication I've had from any level of government as a taxpayer about what my taxes are used for is a flyer that comes from the council with my annual council tax bill, usually with a picture of a bin being emptied. Uh, if we want people to have uh, confidence in this new Scottish approach to taxation, should the Scottish government be spending some time thinking about how it communicates to taxpayers as individuals what it's trying to achieve and more particularly why? Why it relates, why taxation relates to the challenges that we face collectively as a society. I, I tend to agree with that, and I, I, I you know, I, I think earlier on I, I alluded to what I don't think is a very good way of uh, uh, defining our setting our tax system, which is the UK, the the, the the way that the UK has done it for the last goodness knows how long. Um, and uh, a, I know that you had uh, Neil Warren from the University of New South Wales give you evidence some time ago, and, and I was particularly struck by his uh, um, reporting of the system that is used in New Zealand, which seems to be much more encompassing 
and goes through various stages. What, what I'm talking about is, is changing the tax system involves various stages, sort of strategic, uh, tactical, operational, and so on. And the, at the strategic level, uh, large numbers of stakeholders are, are involved in the process so that they can better understand not only the gains but also the potential costs associated with, uh, with significant changes to the system. I would also agree with that. I mean, I, I, as long as one does not get too hung up on or devote, you know, ridiculous, very large resources to it, or indeed it then gets used as a political football, to, you know, if it gets slightly wrong, then that should not be the end of the world. But I think that kind of transparency is extremely important and, and will be helpful in the, the, the people's acceptance of the tax system. Because in the end, a tax system has to be acceptable to those who pay the taxes. I'm being boring. I'm agreeing um, with them as well. Um, I think HMRC actually at the moment do send you a statement every year and it's got a pie chart and it tells you broadly where your tax has been spent. Um, there, there's some criticisms of that because it's just income tax and uh, national insurance I think that it covers. So it doesn't really explain where all of your tax is going. Um, so I think there has been some attempt, but I think we'd welcome more transparency. Okay. Dean. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, my question is more technical rather than uh, relating to principles of, of taxation. It relates to the correlation between GDP growth and tax take by the Scottish Government. Professor Bell, in, in paragraph 22 of your uh, paper, you say that uh, the makeup of the tax base in, or for income tax in Scotland is noticeably different from that of the rest of the UK. In Scotland, just 0.7% of taxpayers pay the additional rate of income tax compared to 1.1% in the UK as a whole. Does this mean that the same level of GDP growth in Scotland may result in lower tax take in Scotland compared to the rest of the UK? And the reason I ask is because under the new fiscal framework, relative tax take in Scotland versus the rest of the UK will in part determine the level of public spending? Um, so, um, this is in, this relates to the block grant adjustment and the per capita indexed uh, uh, adjustment mechanism. Um, I don't think of itself the fact that um, we have a lower proportion of additional rate taxpayers necessarily means that with a given rate of GDP growth, income tax revenues in Scotland will grow less fast. Um, this is, it all depends where that growth is, is coming. Um, uh, you know, Part of the reason, actually, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about income tax revenues is not at this end of the of, of the of the income spectrum, but at the lower end. That a lot of the increase in employment in the since the the Great Recession has been relatively low wage. The kind of people and, uh, uh, who are employed at levels of income that are below the income tax threshold, and we could we could see a, a pretty significant increase in Scottish uh, GDP and a big growth in employment without necessarily seeing any significant increase in uh, in income tax revenues. So I think this is an issue that is of considerable importance. I think it's difficult to predict based on the distribution of taxpayers at the different levels, but the additional rate taxpayers are very important. The, 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 there's no question that, that, that that's the case. And Scotland could not afford to lose a significant uh, number of them. I, I, I ran a, um, a uh, survey of personal incomes recently to look at the most recent data and, and the top 1% of taxpayers, which goes beyond the additional rate taxpayers in Scotland, uh, contribute 23% of the total uh, income tax revenues. So they are a critical group in terms of the overall uh, uh, tax take. And their issues around how they account for their income become very, very important. Not, not my feel, but I, I would agree. I don't, I don't think there is a direct correlation between... That, that's not two things that go particularly well together. The number or proportion of additional rate taxpayers and GDP growth, I don't think, are likely to fit particularly well together as, as, as um, parallel indicators. 
Thank you very much for the witnesses for coming along today and beginning our discussion into tax principles. This is the first session we've had on that, and it's obviously a bit more complicated than I'd anticipated at the beginning of this process. Um, but it's going to be an important discussion we'll have as the months go on. Um, I thank the witnesses for coming. At the start of the meeting, we agreed to take the next items in private, and therefore now close the public part of this meeting. Thank you very much.